I'd like to call the uh, May 26th, uh, 22nd, uh, Russian, the month of what? <laughs> school committee meeting to order. Uh, we'll start with public input if there is any. Uh, seeing none, uh, tonight we we have uh, a science presentation which we'll, we'll go with first and after that we'll, we'll do uh, the consent agenda of uh, the uh, school contract, the school food service contract and then reports. So Right off you the bat, okay. Ready to go. Very good. <coughs> I apologize. I don't have too much of a voice today, but I will do my best. I'm going to be handing it over eventually to our colleagues here. We have Miss um, Leonard, Heather Leonard, who's going to be giving a brief update about the elementary portion. Um, Sarah Marchant, middle school principal, and Kim Peterson, our teacher leader for science for the middle level. Um, and then Marianne Lynn, the science department head, will be talking about the high school level. So I thought I would just sort of kick it off with a uh, brief introduction. So as we talked about last year, and as I think everybody knows, last spring in April of 2016, the state officially adopted their new framework for, for science, uh, technology, engineering. Um, I think I actually used a version of this slide last year. The only thing I really wanted to emphasize again, of course, are in the introduction of this document, it really lays out its, their goals, their vision for that. And as it says down there in, the, in that bottom check mark, the bottom bullet there, that these goals can really only be achieved through a rich and varied STE curriculum. You know, and that really is up to each school system to provide. The standards sort of set out these goals. Um, both in terms of content and in terms of practices, really focusing on this inquiry-based and hands-on experience that they would like school districts to provide for students. So I thought that was worth sort of re-emphasizing. We've also since been looking at some other organizations and documents. Um, this was the framework. This another document, which is a pretty thick document that I know I've been using and some other districts have used is by the National Research Council, it's run by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and, and Medicine that have sort of weighed in on the new standards. Um, this is taking a national perspective. Basically there, I mean, as some of those bullets, bullet points emphasize, same goals really, same vision that the Massachusetts framework has of really bringing these, this topic to life for students. Um, really engaging students with hands-on experience and realizing that achieving this vision really r is a major undertaking because it's not just a matter of changing some standards or getting some different resources, but in some cases it really is a, uh, a shift in some instructional approaches. And to do this well um, will require a real vertical K-12 um, perspective. One of the things I really like about their document um, is that I thought it, it was very pragmatic in the way it talks about how to implement this vision. Um, you know, it says that we really need to have this vision that understands that this is a complex change, um, especially that it, that it needs to take place um, at all different levels of education. It's gonna require very coordinated planning and rollout. I like the fact in that third bullet there that it says this is gonna take time. This is not something that happens in one year. Um, and it really talks about how this has to be a multi-year process, um, that professional development is gonna need to be a part of that, that both teachers and administrators will need to become familiar with not only the new standards, but some new approaches to instruction. Um, and I, I must say, I need to commend all of our staff um, in that, that, you know, in some of my conversations, to be really candid with some other districts, this is a, it's, it's a big shift, um, and I'm really, proud to be working with our educators here because at no point have we said no, no this is a change we have to make um, whether it's something that we're accustomed to or not they've sort of come to these conclusions and they're advocating for them their, themselves um, we might realize that it's not going to be perfect we're not going to be great at it at first it's going to be a multi-year process but they realize this is a direction that we need to go um, to benefit our students um, so they've really been key partners in this that last bullet point there too that they make is that the collaboration 
and forming networks and partnerships will be powerful in this work. And we've begun to do that as well, not only with um, some of the publishers and vendors that we're working with in the different types of PD, um, but even more recently with some other school districts. I mean, a few weeks ago, for instance, I was, I've met a couple times now with other districts um, that, are that are using the No Adam program as an example, the elementary school, um, to talk about ways that we can collaborate and provide professional development for teachers together, um, and even working with that publisher to really sort of expedite um, and better facilitate the work ahead of us. And so that's been really promising. I think it's great when districts partner in that way. Um, so. Again, as I said, um, and we talked a little bit about this last year, there are eight science and engineering practices that are embedded throughout the document at all levels. Um, obviously, these have always been a part of science, technology, engineering, but these standards really put a greater emphasis even on these. And so you'll see as we go through this evening's pr presentation sort of how that plays out at the different levels, but we've been taking that very seriously. Another slide that I've shown before, but I keep showing it at every option or every possibility that I have, whether we're talking about math, science, ELA, is that with these shifts in the standards and all of these content areas, there are obvious overlaps. Um, and that's really by design, um, as you can see there in that sort of three-part Venn diagram, that some of these um, standards, especially the practices, you know, there's overlaps between math and science and ELA and science and math and ELA and then that sort of white area in the middle, there's overlap among all of them. Um, things like how to build a strong knowledge through content-rich texts, which shows that the literacy strands really connect with all three of those content areas. Things like um, being able to read, write, and speak grounded in evidence to provide evidence for your positions. Um, um, constructing viable arguments, engaging in argument from evidence. All of tho those particular skills overlap with all of them areas and that's something we're very cognizant about as we're providing PD and as we're developing our curriculum in all three of those content areas. The other slide that I keep showing every chance I get is sort of the, <coughs> this, the levels of thinking because I keep wanting to stress you know that clearly we do all of this in education um, but with the new standards it really is about those top two tiers um, that of course we want students to be able to remember and understand the information, but in this day and age where the information is readily available um, through all sorts of devices, um, we really put a new emphasis on how we can reference, um, apply, use that information in a meaningful way. So we're trying through the activities and the curriculum that we put in place to move kids not only to applying but even beyond creating, analyzing, um, evaluating really top levels of higher order thinking. Just I picked out a few bullet points there from the beginning of the, um, the framework. Basically we've talked about these, their, their vision, um, again, over and over again they're stressing the focus on the conceptual understandings and the application of these concepts, um, focusing on those practices making sure that this is spread coherently from pre-K through eight and on through high school, really stressing as well how um, this connects and is aligned both to the ELA standards and the math standards. Um, and then those final two bullets there, those last two check marks, I thought were um, especially applicable or, or maybe relevant to point out that this time the state is saying, and we're still yet to see their new assessments, but that they're taking those practice standards and this approach so seriously that they are looking at ways to, to assess students with the new MCAS 2.0 to make sure that they are assessing not just the content, the information knowledge, knowledge but the practices, um, and that they are still considering strategies to do that within their assessment. Um, and, and the advice that they're giving to all districts, that final bullet there, is that at all grades, the more that we integrate these practices into our curriculum and instruction, whenever possible, they believe that um, it will enhance student learning and ultimately their success on the assessments that they'll be rolling out. And speaking of the new assessments, I thought I would just revisit and, and um, share the state's timeline thus far. 
Again, they're taking sort of a three-year approach to this. As you can see, this year's 2016-2017 um, MCAS, which has just happened or is happening right now, yeah. right? Like yeah. today, right? Um, yeah. um, is still assessing their, their 2006 standards. Um, next year, the goal is to assess the overlapping standards between 20, uh, 2006 and 2016. I believe the state also has just identified those specific standards, which would be the priority f standards for next year, those overlapping standards. The goal then would be for 2018-19 to be the first time that they are assessing solely in grade five and grade eight, the 2016 standards solely. We're anticipating that that will probably happen for high school as well, but they have yet to determine that officially because that's still pending the Board of Education's discussion and decision, which is coming up. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to begin going to the different levels to Ms. Leonard for elementary. Sorry, I thought we did. Uh, thank you again for letting me visit and be here. Um, I'm excited to share a bit about the elementary school work. And I think um, Mr. Martin did a great job of laying it out. But I, I think similar to the ELA standards and the math standards, they did a nice job of organizing them. So you can follow themes through, which I can't say were done in previous versions. Um, in my former life, when I was a science teacher, there was sort of this lump of somewhere between six and eight teach these things, and you sort of had to piecemeal and figure it out. But there's just the design of standards alone create more of a vertical articulation, which had been missing. So it ensures that you're not doing the volcano three years out of your six in elementary school. Um, but that rather they're building upon knowledge and building upon skill as they go through their schooling. So I think the organization alone, it's a really nice bedside reading, um, but you can follow some themes through and see how it takes that level of rigor up each year, which I think is just a nice way to organize a document where previously I don't think we did that as well. Um, and I, so I think some of the key themes in the start, in the front of the frameworks that you'll see include these three big themes I'm gonna mention. One being relevance, which is an amazing way to address the fact that kids ask the question, why do I need to know this? And we better have a good answer for them. And I think the science standards do a really nice job of thinking about where are you currently? What are questions you currently have, which scientists would then explore? And what are problems that we currently see, which engineers would then be designing solutions to solve? And so thinking about the relevance, I love the language from the standards that says, we're looking at the ability to apply knowledge and skills and to analyze the world around them. And it also looks at addressing prior knowledge and misconceptions. Because what happens often with our younger learners is they have developed their own understanding of how the world works. And they can build their understanding of science around these faulty misconceptions. But when your foundation is not built on something strong, you can get up to these more complex sciences. And then all of a sudden, your assumptions are completely thrown off. And, and that can create a lot of unlearning and relearning. So really making sure that we're looking at everyday happenings and their own background knowledge and experiences with the world. And that comes from using real world questions and real world connections that they have. Um, I think in the elementary school, there's definitely a lot of curiosity, a lot of wanting to touch and do. And these standards do that make that shift away from um, sit and listen or, or sort of the knowledge only delivery. Um, similarly with the rigor, I think it shifts away from memorization of terms memorization of cycles or processes and shifting more into understanding the analysis and the why and what happens. A big shift I think in this area of rigor is that they're actually looking at problem solving as students. So you know I can remember back to some of my science days as a student where the teacher had the experiment right and you write the hypothesis that she wrote on the board or he wrote on the board and then you follow these steps exactly the way they said right you write them down in your lab port report that way you use it in that exact way. And if you got the wrong results, wrong results, then you have to go and get data from another group because you messed up. That's really not science in any sense of the word. So it's absolutely adding that fact that it is uncertain and you don't know what's gonna happen. And sometimes things go wrong and it's our job as scientists to figure out why. What does that mean and how are we analyzing those results? And that's massively risky when you're looking at potentially a class of six-year-olds that are all expecting their bean plants to grow, and they don't, and what happens, and why? Um, so I think that level of rigor still comes into 
not only the work, but that application analysis of what are we seeing, what makes sense, what doesn't, how would you change, what would you do different? Um, and that's something that seeing the students do it with the adults, but also with each other, that they're collaborating in groups, that they're working together to solve problems, they're sharing their ideas. It's really increasing the expectation of their involvement in the content and the learning, instead of, again, that I'm gonna follow those rote steps, um, which more traditionally, many years ago, was sort of the way you did science, especially in the elementary schools, because it was sort of be like a one day a week, you got a project and you did it and you left it. And that's really shifted as you can see from a lot of pictures from my little learners and my teachers. Um, and again, it goes into that idea that, that this work is coherent, so that I mentioned that complement to that vertical articulation that is so cleanly laid out and comes in a natural scaffolded progression that it's not a one-time exposure. You have a year of earth science and then you never hear about it again. Instead, that the, the, it's more based around having a story and a theme that connects with each of those years, what makes sense, what are those important topics and how do they build upon each other and become more complex. Um, and that's something that I think the standards do well and it's something I think that um, the No Adam curriculum that we've been utilizing in that grades three through five has been doing a really wonderful job with. <coughs> so the history of what we've done so far, it's newer obviously. In 2015-16, our grades five and some other additional grades and classes sprinkled throughout the schools, piloted the No Adam program to very high responses from both the staff and the students and my parents. I have to admit, I've heard a lot of really positive feedback of, wow, my kid came home and made us get up from the dinner table and make a molecule in the middle of our dining room table and he's in third grade, it was awesome. So it's really exciting to hear the strengths of what, what the students are getting excited about and what they're learning. Um, so in 2016, the state adopted the curriculum framework. So if you notice, we've been a few steps ahead of the next generation science standards have been brewing for quite a while. So we saw them coming and I think the district did a really nice job laying the foundation so we were ahead of the curve. Um, in 2016-17, the Noah Adam curriculum made revisions to align with the Massachusetts standards because they were a little tweaked. So No Adam adjusted that and we've implemented those in grades three, four, and five across all of the elementary schools in the whole district. So again, the benefit of the no, no Adam, for example, in the three through five is, as Mr. Martin mentioned, it is integrated. So it's pulling in your mathematics knowledge and skills. It's pulling in your ability to read, to write, to communicate about your learning and to collaborate those listening and speaking skills, those abilities to communicate your knowledge. It might be analysis, it might be sharing your assumptions based on your hypothesis, uh, but they're really embedded in the curriculum tools that come with No Adam and also that expectation of the way that you're running your classroom and the way those teachers are teaching science. It is, it's a shifted role and responsibility in the types of dialogue and discussion they're having in classes. Um, the benefit of No Adam is it literally arrives in your store doorstep and everything is there. So obviously the teachers are doing their reading, they're researching, understanding what's coming, and then No Adam actually delivers boxes I don't know, four or five, six times a year and it's like grade five consumables for unit three through six and it just arrives in a timely manner and the teachers have it all ready to go. So we're not hunting and scrounging to try to find all the pieces, that the time is spent on preparing the learning instead of preparing the materials, which is a really nice benefit again to going towards that. The more hands-on you get, the more work and prep it takes. Um, the benefit obviously of the hands-on inquiry base is that we're thinking more critically instead of more in a memorization tone. Um, and that the program is really based on the scientific method and the engineering design. And thinking about, you know, if we're solving a problem, what do good engineers do to try to solve and address a problem? And if we have a question, how could you set up your design to make sure that it can be replicated? If you're coming up with answers, could other scientists replicate this to find out if your answers to your questions are valid? Uh, so, this mentioned, I mentioned that spiraling. So the No Adam curriculum follows that idea of the spiraling within the standards. So you see the themes continue through the grades and it, it just increases in rigor and expectation. So they're gonna hear and touch upon some of the same skills and same knowledge, but they increase through each year and they get um, more and more complex as they go up through so that they have a well-rounded perspective about science and engineering, which was a, historically, again, something that was less often touched upon. Um, but those skills are embedded throughout the different curriculum units. 
and what next steps. So I've mentioned a bit about 3-5. So we'll be continuing to do the work with No Adam in grades 3 through 5 across the elementary schools and looking at what's appropriate for our kindergarten through second grade. Our, what we know is what has been shown is that the best thing you can do is embed it and have it connected and integrated to the other content areas. So the work that we're going to be doing is looking with the group of teachers who've been doing the work with, with the new science standards is looking at what are those key focus areas, what are those themes throughout each of the grades that are most important, and identifying key literacy resources, read aloud books, small guided reading groups that we can do along those nonfiction themes, what are the different topics that we could write about, what are really important hands-on activities that our kindergarten through second grade students need the opportunity to be exposed to, while being respectful of what's developmentally appropriate for them, what's an appropriate way to integrate across our reading, our writing, and our mathematics, and even in some of our history, so that we make sure that we're embedding that those scientific themes in ways that are authentic and not a separate thing you do by itself. So we're working to create those, those curriculum guides and curriculum documents, along with some suggested pacing guides. We're starting that work now with the goal of having some drafts be ready for the incoming school year. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Kim Peterson. I'm the 8th grade science teacher at Parker Middle School. Um, so, PLCs have been really helpful uh, to work together with Coolidge. Uh, we've been working closely, not just on our scheduled dates, but on through collaboration on other days, and obviously email and phone calls, because we really want to be on the same page to be able to work together so our, uh, both middle school students have the best opportunity for science. Um, last year was very rigorous. We were introduced to the fact that we were going to have these new integrated curriculum. So beginning in 2015, we started to unpack those new standards of the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Um, as you know, we've always done this, what we like to call pancake format, where 6th grade is your physical science, 7th grade is your life science, and 8th grade is your earth and space. This year, starting in sixth grade, we've now integrated where we're doing all disciplines across the level. So again, that is currently started this year for 16, 17 uh, integration in sixth grade. Next year, instead of life science, those students who just had that integration will again have the new standards for seventh grade. And then by the time they get to eighth grade um, in two years, <coughs> they'll have the integration again. So right now, Last year, we worked on really finding resources to support our teachers, especially on the sixth grade level. Um, we first started out with really collaborating with each other um, and what we've already had, because obviously we've all taught these realms of science. So um, we've created platforms where we have shared materials and shared lesson plans. Um, but we really wanted to find curriculum resources to be able to, again, support us um, as far as integrating the new standards, we really wanted to be hands-on, heavy, inquiry-based, because um, Heather did a great job talking about the new standards. It's, it's not a term uh, heavy. It's, it's very much the skill base that they're understanding. Um, they're understanding the application of it, the scientific process. So it really gives the teacher a little bit more autonomy to kind of like how they want to really uh, tackle that. So we each kind of went in with a different mindset, um, but all agreeing that science is learned through experience, and so <coughs> finding resources that really fostered that was important to us. All right. Yeah. So again, like I said, the sixth grade and now is currently spiraled. Uh, they're doing really well with it. Students seem to be enjoying all the realms of science, learning about phases of the moon, human body systems, and engineering design. Last year, um, the top choice for the sixth grade teachers was the McGraw-Hills Glencoe Eye Science. So they um, have a digital platform for that. They've also got a half a cart for each classroom to be able to support that as well. Uh, about eight years ago, I started using this program called explorelearning.com, and they're, they're known as Gizmos, and they're online lab simulations. And if you do have license to the program, it's basically lab simulations of hands-on, inquiry-based activities that you wouldn't normally, if you don't have the resources for, this provides you. And I'll show you a demo of that. Um, 
so that's what the sixth grade, the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade all have gizmos. And again, we each have a half a cart to support the technology base for that. Um, and they, the students all have their own logins for the iScience and the gizmo. So if anything was to roll into homework um, or flipping the classroom, however the teacher likes to do it, they have the access to that. And they're also able to grade and see the progress for each of their students as well. And that's only available through owning the license of the programs. Um, so again, focus on hands-on inquiry-based teaching as learning. At Reading, we all have great teachers that understand that this is, you know, we want to see kids doing science, not up there, you know, taking notes on science. Um, you know, we don't learn our bicycles by watching a video. <laughs> so whenever you go into a science classroom now, that's, that's what you're going to see. You're going to see kids collaborating, working in groups. Um, and we've already done that, but these resources that we've been provided only help us, you know, be better teachers with that. Professional development has been greatly provided to us. Um, sixth grade teachers last year were given time after school hours, summer hours, to be able to collaborate with each other and really just unpack their standards and become stronger. Um, you know, it, it is a little bit intimidating at first knowing that you're going to have a new curriculum, but I think we dove into that you know, quite nicely together. And we all supported each other, which again is, is a great benefit for the PLCs. Um, and a nice thing too is the integration of teaching engineering is also now part of the standards. So on top of finding resources for the science that we already teach, we, we want, really wanted to make sure that a subject that we might not have been familiar with, the engineering and technology, was also a part of that, and it has been. So uh, the resources that we've chosen have actually mirrored the um, Massachusetts new science standards, which has been great. Um, and what's nice is a lot of that engineering lessons are integrated into the science as well. So it's not just like, okay, this time you're learning bridges, you learn about those things as you learn about, I don't know, human anatomy or something like that. So you can kind of mesh things together, which is a little bit more organic with that type of learning. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm gonna show you two of the, so the gizmos, are what I uh, told you about, they're the online lab simulations, which we're all using for different sciences. The STEM scopes, it's Accelerate Learning. It's through Rice University, and that is the resource that the seventh and eighth grade teachers chose last year to use uh, for spiraling our curriculum to help us. And um, I'm gonna show you the platform for that and kind of give you a feel of why we thought that would be the best for the type of learning we wanted to do. If you don't mind, I can just ask. So here is uh, the basic, if you were to log in as a teacher, this is the STEM scopes. So what I would do as an eighth grade teacher, I would already have all my stuff set up, but let's say I'm just starting this new, or if I wanted to find something new. Um, again, the grades are for our new standards, so sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. This is for middle school, this is what we have the license for. So I would go to eighth grade. And then I can do any specific topic, <coughs> physical, life, or earth, Earth and space, or I can just scroll through the topics. And what's really nice is that these all mirror the new science standards, which we really liked. It made things easier. So just for an example, let's scroll down. Let's go to genetic variation. Um, so a lot of the new science, what we're doing is claim evidence reasoning. We're also doing these five E things, we call it. So it's engage, explore, explain, elaborate, evaluate. Um, and what I like about this, you can kind of take what you want if you want to take it, if you want to make something of your own. It, it's not a huge, like we didn't choose McGraw-Hill for seventh and eighth grade because we wanted a little bit of our own um, autonomy to have, but this gives you a lot of access to, if you just only want to base, you could on this. So engage obviously is bringing the students in, so you've got things like the hook, and again, all this is hands-on, they, they give you the set of materials, they give you any printouts if you need to. Explore would be any of the activities, and as you can see, there are several here, so you can even level these as well. So that's where, you know, you have the engage, bringing the students in, the explore is the hands-on that the kids would do together. Okay, then you would go into the explain, 
and explain has different ways as well. Um, you've got uh, explain through communication, you've got videos, you've got literacy, you've got vocabulary, and then you have an elaboration, which kind of brings you in, connected into other subjects as well. So you have math connections, several reading connections, science today, okay, so kids can see media as well, career correction, uh, connections. So, you know, as Heather discussed with students, they're kind of like, why do I need to learn this? This has the elaborate part, which kind of makes a lot of nice um, intercurricular connections with other subjects. Then you've got the evaluate, and again, whether a teacher wants to use this or not. Um, I talked about the claim evidence reasoning, and just to give you a perfect example, tomorrow um, we're learning about environmental global climate change and giving them a claim, and they have to go through the resources to, to find the evidence to support that claim, and then the reasonings why. So a lot of teachers are kind of going into that claim evidence reasoning as their summative assessment, just to, you know, to get away from your basic A, B, C, D multiple choices, because it really doesn't allow for that critical analysis that we want to see our students doing. Then you've got open-ended responses, multiple choice assessments if you want, um, and then performance expectations assessment tests, um, which also allows for you know, different differentiation as well. If you have you know, different students who learn and, and are assessed in different ways, this is a great platform for that. So that's the STEM scopes. And then the explore learning. Um, what I really liked about this, especially as an earth and space teacher, I felt that and I always wanted to do that inquiry-based hands-on, but the materials really didn't allow for that. You know, how do you talk about the Big Bang with, like, you know, hands-on manipulatives? <laughs> what this does is it actually allows students to see things on a level that normally we would not have. So, for instance, um, phase changes, if you go, you know, I just turn the temperature up, you know, and you click play. So these are all interactive. And then uh, if you put it on micro view, you can see what's going on in the atomic level, which normally you would not be able to. So this is very a simple um, example. And then if you go back, what the teacher would do is sh uh, she or he would print out, this is called a uh, exploration sheet. So I'll just open these up, this up. And basically what this does You've got the hook again. You've got your prior knowledge questions, which kids don't need to have any you know, information on phase change. This kind of like opens them up to the topic. And then these questions, as they go along, it's, it's not so much directions, but they're telling you to do things in the directions. And then there's the inquiry right there with those questions of what's going on. So it's that back and forth integration that you would do in a lab setting, but this allows you to do things if you didn't have those materials for the lab. Um, another Good example would be, you know, a human cell. You take a sample from a hand, um, and then the gizmo will go through, you know, what the different organelles would be, and um, so it it's it's pretty neat. And again, I, I started using this eight years ago, and they every year have come up with like ten different gizmos for every subject. So it's it's a company that continues to expand and explore, um, and then along with. Uh, student exploration sheet you've got a teacher guide which I often use and what the teacher guide does is gives you objectives any extensions you want to do discussion questions scientific background um, and then they have additional resources as well and also on the site they have other science teachers commenting and giving additional resources as well to add to any of the gizmos that they've been using um, I have a couple of ELL students, and I found that giving them this vocabulary sheet has been helpful as well, and part of their assignment will be to translate. I have a, um, really solely uh, speaks Portuguese, and so I'll have him kind of translate this first, and this is already done for me. You know, I don't have to find the vocabulary, and he'll just translate that into his own language to be able to understand this before he goes into the, uh, the gizmo. So there's several resources just on this website alone, which I have found really helpful. So I'm going to introduce, yep, Sarah. 
you. And thank you all for being here tonight to listen to us. And I just want to commend Kim because she's a great example not only of phenomenal teaching happening at the middle school, but she didn't mention that she's a curriculum leader too for the for the middle level science teachers. So that means she's done a lot of the structuring of the conversations happening at the PLC and she's done an amazing job. So um, I want to shout out to her. And I'm going to also take a little moment to give a shout out to our Coolidge Science team who I don't know if you heard, but they earned a 26th place finish at the national tournament this past wow. weekend. So I'm very proud on their behalf. I know. So, um, hopefully they're hearing our praises from afar. Um, so this is a lovely approach, I think, to talking about these standards because just like everyone ahead of me has said, you can map out these new standards strand by strand from K to 12. And it's when you actually can pull it up on a computer screen, the Massachusetts standard creates this huge, almost beautiful map <coughs> of how these standards build on each other and how the rigor increases. And I feel like we're doing that, sort of modeling that <laughs> in our presentation today. So I don't want to necessarily repeat everything that's been said, but at the middle level, as Kim has said, we have really been focusing on how to really turn the tables and have it be about exploration and inquiry and have the students not be scared to take risks because so much in science and engineering is not about there being a right answer all of the time, but it's about how those answers change due to change variables and, and that it's not just about looking up what the right answer is because mm -hmm. technology allows us to do that at every turn. So what are we doing with that information is really the direction that we're going. Um, engineering has been a new piece in all of this and I think at first an anxiety producing piece, if I can be honest, just teachers feel like they have a certain wheelhouse and a certain expertise, and especially at the middle level where they you know, very often have been biology majors or, or science majors and they feel like they have an area of expertise. So this, one of the challenges has been to build the comfort level of our teachers to expand into all of the different um, sciences and to build their confidence and and um, knowledge base, but then give the resources too to help and support. So that's been, at what it was at first anxiety producing might now be really exciting because the collaboration going on has been really phenomenal. And like Kim mentioned, the resource sharing and just the excitement that I hear when I'm at the meetings about people wanting to share this lab and do this. And um, so it's really fantastic. Engineering was new to everybody. Um, Prior to this year, engineering was only offered at the middle level as part of an elective or an extension option and not as something integrated into the curriculum for everybody. And so a huge shift, and which happened in sixth grade this year and will continue to change, is that we are shifting our resources and not just thinking project lead the way extension activities, but how can we take that and move it into the classroom and provide opportunities and resources for all children in the classroom. Um, so that is something that we're really talking a lot about now, especially at the end of year, preparing ourselves for the coming year. How do we make sure that all of our science classrooms have the materials to support good engineering desi design, you know, the design process and the building process and the, and the renovation of that that is part of the process. So what do, what do teachers need to be able to create those hands-on activities is really important right now. Um, while we will continue to do more of those extension activities in the elective space, those will be um, the higher level things that might that not all students will get in the science classroom, but that if kids are really, really liking engineering, they can do more of it in that elective type of So that will still exist. It's just different. We're using our resources differently, and we really want to focus on all students. Um, looking ahead, so just as Kim mentioned, we're excited to have our seventh grade teachers next year continue this spiraling approach and and have our current sixth graders who are getting used to that. They've, they, they were doing the first class to do no Adam in fifth grade and now sixth grade the spiral. So they're, this is in their wheelhouse now and they're, they're living and breathing this new model, which is fantastic. <coughs> Kim showed you the resources that the teachers have available to them. And certainly they're not limited to that because it is a very creative bunch who are always coming up with the most exciting thing. So I, every classroom looks different, a little, a little bit different every day, and that's very exciting. Um, in June, both middle schools are going to be a part of the Department of Education's pilot of some questions for the new science standards. And this has a dual purpose. One is that the Department of Education gets to see how, how students do on these new, more inquiry-based questions. 
and we see it as an advantage to us as well because we get to see what the questions might look like and make sure we're best preparing students for that. Um, and you know, we've presented to you over the last year or two about our initiatives in this regard, and I do just want to say thank you to the committee and to the town for your support. Um, science did need a big renovation in this town, and we are so grateful that the town is backing this, and exciting things are happening, and I hope you come visit anytime, because we, we, we'd love to have you, so. And without further ado, Mary Ann Lenny for the Thank you, yeah. Sarah. So again, thank you for having us this evening. I'm Marianne Lynn, and I'm the science department head at the high school. And I thank Heather and Sarah and Kim um, for the exciting work that's being done at the elementary and the middle school levels. And as they have said, and as Craig has said, really this vertical approach is so important to developing a cohesive program and to having our students developing skills that will ultimately prepare them for advanced science courses at the high school. And I think um, can't be underestimated how important it is to develop that STEM mindset early on in a child's um, educational program so that they're really comfortable with these subjects from a very early age and excited. And there's so much to be excited about in these science classes. So, let me see if I got this right. So I wanted to start with just why update the frameworks and the curriculum at the elementary and the middle and the high school. And I just posted a few topics in science, which if you think about how much these have changed in the past 10 years <laughs> from the last time that we had frameworks in Massachusetts, I'm probably understating it when I say that this is, the changes have been dramatic. And from year to year, these changes are so significant um, that lots of times even the content is changing. And so this emphasis of really teaching science as learning skills and being able to think like a scientist and being able to develop those higher order thinking skills of analyzing and evaluating and looking at evidence and forming conclusions from it are really the skills that we want to teach because the content, while it's important, can be obsolete within a couple of years. And so that's why we are really seeing this switch to integrating content with this inquiry-based approach and teaching the science practices in addition to the curriculum. <coughs> um, what we know for sure and what we want students to leave Reading with is a science background that will prepare them to make key decisions in their lives that are science related and to make them college and career ready. And so um, it was interesting. I went to a conference a couple of years ago that was put on by DESI and they had conducted a study of job opportunities in Massachusetts, or job postings over a four month period. And what they found was that 32% of all jobs were in STEM careers in Massachusetts at that time. And 60% of the jobs with a median income of $60,000 or more were STEM related fields. And so, we want to make sure that our students have the opportunity to pursue such fields if they so desire. And so make sure that they are well prepared when they leave our school system. And so um, one thing that I will say is that, and I think Heather and Sarah and Kim have all said this as well, we've known for a long time in science that inquiry is the way to go and that really having students explore science and use that hands-on approach is so important and tapping into that natural curiosity that they already have. And so we actually have been doing that for long before these new standards were introduced. And just a couple of examples of that that I can give from the high school experience is and on any given day, if you're traversing the halls of RMHS, 
you might see students who are launching hot air balloons to test Boyle's gas laws. So they create these balloons, they launch them. You might see kids who are running up and down the stairwells so that they can determine how much energy it actually takes to um, burn off that Hershey's bar that they ate, or they're running the stairwells in order to do a respiration lab. For a long time, we have um, fostered partnerships with local colleges and universities uh, where we can go and do biotech labs that we're not able to do at the high school. We have partnerships with businesses where students can go to engineering companies or pharmaceutical companies and learn about STEM careers and see STEM in process. Um, again, before these new standards came out, we were expanding our engineering program at the high school. And so through a, a large grant, we were able to expand our engineering program from one CAD course to now having four engineering courses in our program of studies. And um, related to uh, 2013, our physics program applied and received a grant from REF and the Reading Cooperative Bank, which allowed them to outfit two labs in the high school with equipment that really would allow them to utilize this hands-on approach to science. And in just speaking with some of the physics teachers this week, they were telling me that by the end of this year, the physics curriculum will actually have done upward of 78 labs over the course of the year. So again, we really are looking at using this hands-on approach. What these new standards really do for us is they make this integration of science practices and content really explicit. And so I just have an example of one of the standards from the 2006 version of the frameworks which you can see is just strictly content related, like this is what the students need to know. Whereas if you look at the 2016 version, it not only tells us what the students need to know, but also how the students will show their knowledge of that content, or in other words, the science skills that they need in order to show the content knowledge. The new standards also give us assessment boundaries. And by that, so for example, this particular framework here, or this particular standard in the framework, relates to how genes get passed from parent to offspring. And in previous years, and in 2006, students had to know the exact phases of meiosis, which is strictly rote memorization. And now they're saying, Students don't have to know these individual phases. Basically, they need to know the big picture of how genes get from parent to offspring. And so that's basically the transition that we are seeing there. Also, what these new science standards have allowed us the opportunity to do at the high school is really to reflect upon our instructional practices. While I say that we already utilize a hands-on inquiry approach, I think we always have room to grow. And so basically, um, what we are in the process of doing is really looking at our practices, looking at what we're teaching, and making sure that we're utilizing those higher order thinking skills and our instructional practices that Craig mentioned, so creation and evaluation and analysis. And so these are just those practices, as, as Craig says, worth another look, right? The eight practices that we looked at there. Um, and basically, I'm going to quote the same study that Craig was quoting from the National Resource Council of the National Academies of Science and Engineering and Medicine, which basically says that by utilizing this approach where you're integrating practice with content, you're really one, increasing an interest in STEM on the part of children because they're actively engaged in what they're doing. 
And in all honesty, it really better reflects what scientists and engineers do because they are always active and engaged in scientific thinking. So um, these are just our wide array of course offerings that we have at the high school. And you'll notice that we have classes in all of our life sciences, physical sciences, and engineering. While engineering has its own separate courses here at the high school, engineering practices are also integrated into biology and physics and chemistry classes. And that's probably an area where we are working on doing a better job of, do, of doing that. Um, one of the reasons why Massachusetts did not accept the next generation science standards is because science and engineering wasn't its own separate discipline at the high school level. And Massachusetts felt like it was important to have a set of standards that were explicit to technology and engineering at the high school level. And so the standards actually are for the introductory courses at the ninth and 10th grade level. And so all of our ninth graders take biology at the high school and they all prepare for the biology MCAS in June. And our goal is always to have all students pass that biology MCAS so that they meet their graduation requirement early on. Next year, we're actually offering an introduction to physics courses and that will also be an MCAS course. And the reason why we decided to add that was uh, to, so that teachers who I have identified students who would benefit from another year of getting those practice skills, those inquiry skills before going on to chemistry physics would have the opportunity to do so. And students who may not have passed the bio biology MCAS in ninth grade would have a second chance to take an MCAS test at the end of their sophomore year for a course that they're presently in. So what we, what we were doing prior, or what we're doing currently, is that students who didn't pass the biology MCAS get some remediation in their sophomore year and try the biology MCAS again in February and again in June if they don't pass in February. And that's really hard for students who are not currently enrolled in that course. So we think that it will be advantageous having that introduction to physics course for students who might be in that situation. We're up to five AP courses in, the, in sciences. And with the newest one added this year, which is AP Physics One, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but just think it's also worth noting that the College Board is also revising their curriculum or have just finalized the revisions to their biology, chemistry, and physics curriculums. And they're looking at that same shift, more from dense content to more um, scientific skills and practicing analytical skills. And the AP tests reflect that, the types of questions on the AP tests. So in addition to looking at the new standards and revising our biology and chemistry curriculums to align with those new standards, our AP teachers have also been revising their curriculum and have gone to the AP summer institutes in order to learn about those new revisions. I'm also happy to say that I said that all, all of our students take biology and chemistry. Um, and more and more students are also taking that third year of science physics. The class of 2017 will have 92% of the students having taken a physics course here at RMHS. And that's up 7% from five years ago. So, and again, I think that can be attributed to students hearing about this inquiry-based approach, this really um, intensive lab experience that students are having and wanting to take that course as well. 
So I think I spoke to most of what's on this slide in the last couple of slides, which is basically that biology and chemistry started their work in aligning to the new standards in 2015, and we continue to do that work. We're still in the process of evaluating and revising units in order to align to the new standards. Biology is testing out a new sequence this year that is more closely aligned to the progression recommended in the new standards. And so we're going to be evaluating what we liked about that and not in the coming weeks. And we are in the process of looking at textbooks that align with the new standards and that we will be purchasing as part of the science initiative but have not made any decision, any final decisions yet as far as that goes. And so in 2016, we have three new, two new courses and one revamped course. So AP Physics One I mentioned is our fifth AP course in science. And this is a course that actually opens up opportunities for more students to take AP at the high school because senior students who elected to take SCP physics level at their junior year can now take an AP physics in their senior year. And then students who want to challenge themselves in their junior year and take AP physics one as their first year physics course can do that as well. Our other AP physics course, AP Physics C, is very calculus intense and is always a second year physics course. So this just, and students who take AP Physics one could also then go on to take AP Physics C if they were interested in that. Interactive device design is a new engineering course that we have this year and another one that was funded by a REF grant. And so our physics teacher, Steve Cogger, developed this course with the non-traditional engineering students in mind. And so it's really um, driven towards students who are interested in arts and music to tap into programming. And so 17 of the 22 students who are in the class this year have never programmed before. And also, this course has really um, brought more interest in <coughs> females than our other engineering courses have. This year, 40% of the students in the class are females, and our average number of females in the engineering courses is 18%, and so that's, that's much higher and exciting to see. And so I do have one video. Um, what the students are doing in this course is they're using microcontrollers to create instruments of their choice, which requires them to do the programming in order to make them work. So Mr. Cogger just gave me a few videos, and I'm just going to show one. John, I'm not sure where. It's one of the tabs. Yep, I got it right here. Thank you. It's, it's quick. So just the setup is these two students made a harp. And you, you'll hear them explain it, but it's, it's, the sound is not great because this was just filmed on a phone, um, which the sensor is a motion sensor. So they just move their finger over the sensor and can go up the scale. So you see it's, 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 a, it's Legos that they're using and then um,
that's just an example. And so they had to do all the program and programming in order to get that to work. And so the last course on the list is just our environmental courses. And so in previous years, we've had an environmental issues that dovetailed with meteorology or students could take one or the other. And we just felt that we had so many environmental issues that could be addressed with students and that we would like for them to have an understanding of that we have made the course into a two semester course and students may elect to take one or both and one focuses on ecology and one focuses on energy issues but really one of the things that we're doing in that course is really hoping to develop or promote a focus of global citizenship so increase students awareness of um, global issues and then also just to help them in order to participate in a democratic society. And so one example would be around the time of the election, we oftentimes will look at ballot questions that relate to an environmental issue. And students just learn about the issue and then write a position paper in which they demonstrate or they, they take a stand on what, what they would vote for that question and why. And so, and it also expands opportunities for authentic learning experiences, such as what are you gonna vote when you go, <laughs> when you go into the ballot box. Um, so that is the science update. And I think now we're just opening it up to any questions you might have for us. If I could, I really, I made myself a note, I forgot to, I did want to recognize Joel McGinnity, who is the PLC leader for the elementary levels, who's a fifth grade teacher at Killam. She's been doing a phenomenal job organizing the work that for many is not as much their background at the elementary, so she's been doing an excellent job with that. And then also uh, Trisha Stodden, who worked really hard to make sure that every elementary school had a wealth of uh, reading sets of books at various guided reading levels that are nonfiction titles that are directly tied to our curriculum standards. So uh, an amazing amount of work has gone in by the teachers participating in the PLCs and also these two leaders. So I meant to shut them out earlier, so I just had to make sure. I can, I'll start with some questions. Uh, so we can go to slide 15 on the list. The Curious on the. I think this was you, Heather. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious on the, the, were the staffs identifying how how are they when how and when are they doing that? Uh, I guess I'm just trying to get a sense. The kindergarten, of second grade. So uh, we had um, just recently put out a request to say um, this is what our goals are with the K2 to make sure that we're getting some of those. Um, foundational, you know, what are those core standards that we need to make sure that are those priority power standards within the science teams, and what are the ones that we need to think about? They have to build their knowledge of their skills, their skills and knowledge, for example, of the scientific method throughout those K2 uh, years. So I have a group of uh, volunteers of current teachers who've been doing work, some of them who piloted you know, Adam in different grades, some of whom have been on the PLCs, um, and some who have actually done some of that partnership work um, to that are actually gonna, we're getting together in this spring to actually be looking at, based on what we already know about the standards, what's in place three, four, five, that what, what those students need to come in with, what are those core areas that we wanna focus on, and then what, what are those themes that are most appropriately connected, and how can we integrate them? So that's the work that's gonna be happening. Actually, right now, it's being, it's moves team. And the other one, I just, on the pancake versus layer cake, uh, I just want to try and understand. So, I think the way I understand it is we used each year to teach one topic, and now we're teaching all three every year. Is That's that, correct. Okay. Yeah, and the science MCAS is unusual in that at the middle level and mm -hmm. I think at fifth grade too. Um, it will assess all three years in one assessment. So, this time of year, we found our eighth grade teachers. We're in the midst of an earth science year 
we're also trying to reteach physical science and life science concepts and trying to stimulate the brain, you know, even in, in the in cooling day loop. And they were like, said, well, I taught this to you last year. And I guess I don't remember. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so it's kind of moving away from that. And we're still going to have this culminating assessment for better or worse. But what is better is that you'll be bringing back spreading through those topics all three years so, and building on them so students will, I believe, remember them better and be ready to then move on to the high school and, and not have to think back five years to when they last had a specific tech topic. So. We also didn't have engineering and technology in, in any of the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade curricula. So, um, you know, if that was something that teachers wanted to do on the side or extra, that was how it was taught. Um, but now with the new standards, it, it's all there for 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. And so MCAS, one-fourth of the subject that's being assessed is technology and engineering. So this will give all students so much more access to the knowledge and be you know, that much more successful. The other question I had is on the pilot. Uh, is that, when is that, you said it's, there's a pilot in June oh, yeah. for the 2.0? The two middle schools uh, are doing that in the fall of 2013. Is What's the, what's the, is it, so it's two full days and? Oh no, so we're each just doing it on a different day and it's only about a 45 minute assessment. Um, so, and our science teachers look on with the questions and see what's being answered. It's actually on a computer, which is unlike what the current model. The, currently the science MCAS are booklets and handwritten um, and meanwhile the MCAS 2.0 and ELA and math are computer based. So these will be computer based. So. We're kind of curious how they're going to sure. really assess not just the regurgitation of memorize, memorized material, but that kind of inquiry-based model of science. So, and then just one other uh, on the high school. Uh, it's interesting to see, I guess, slide 24, which was the all the courses. Uh, forgive me for so. Can I just walk through, so if I'm a student, I mean, how many of those can I actually take uh, <laughs> if I really want, I'm really a, a, a student that's really interested in science? I mean, how does, I, I'm just trying, I'm so figuring out the schedule and this is sure. a lot there. Um, in ninth grade, all students, like right. I said, will take biology, and some students can fit intro to engineering into their schedule too. In ninth and 10th grade, there's not a lot of flexibility for students to do many science electives because of all of the other requirements that they're trying to meet. But things do open up in 11th and 12th grade, and so we actually have a lot of students, and I could get you the percentage, I don't have it off of the top of my head, who will double up and take two sciences in their junior and senior year. Okay, and do we just determine based on enrollment whether we're going to offer a particular? Yes. Yes, like for example, this year, digital electronics is not running because we only had two students sign up to take it. Dr. John, uh, we, uh, we get lots of great presentations all. This, this was excellent. Uh, I think that, you know, if you can maybe talk to the chair, but I think that if this, if we could take this part of the meeting and maybe put it on a YouTube and kind of as we're talking about things in budget and overrides, I mean, this is important stuff that the community needs to know that's going on here. I mean, this was a very good presentation. Thank you. Yes. I'm actually incredibly impressed with all that you have to do with all the individual difference of the kids, how you fit in getting yourself trained to undertake such a new philosophy and implementation. And so I'm very grateful that you have. Um, I have three questions. One is I'm feeling a little like I shouldn't have to ask this, but with all that you said, I've, I think I've lost it a little bit. So we piloted the no atom, and now it's being implemented. The K through two, you're, it sounds like you're designing your own. So yeah. that's not the no atom. Yep. 
So the so, No Adam, um, it was piloted in 2015, all fifth grade teachers, and then samples of other pockets and grades. So from first grade through fourth grade, different teachers had said, yes, I'd be willing to pilot and try it. Um, so that was 2015. Um, transitioning to this year, grades three, four, and five, all of the third, fourth, and fifth graders are receiving No Adam as their core curriculum. During the pilot, we found a couple of things about No Adam, and I'm sure Craig could speak more to this. Um, it's, it's very intensive on time, appropriately so. And if we're really thinking about instructional minutes and what's developmentally appropriate, again, that integrated model, which is so valuable, and No Adam does a great job bringing it in, but what we're really realizing is more so appropriate potentially for kindergarten through second grade is using the standards as our path and our driver to find what are those core activities, learning skills that we need to bring in, what is the best way to get that? And it might be through read aloud, it might be through physical movement, it might be through games, songs, or hands-on activities, but being really precise about picking them, because as you said, there's only so much time in a day and so much time to do. So what we found was that um, the, the amount of time it would take to fully implement in K through two was not, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily going to be the best match for where our focus is. So, but we're using those experiences to inform our planning for kindergarten through second grade. So when they enter third grade, they have those core foundational knowledge and skills that will allow them to jump right in and be successful. So um, the pilot years have helped us to be thoughtful about our selection um, and will also help to inform our planning. So again, it's a vertical conversation. That's so helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, my second question was born from as you were speaking, I was thinking, oh my goodness, how are they going to do standardized attest assessments on this kind of skill building within a certain amount of time? Um, and so when you, as you were talking, I was um, pleased to hear that you're going to be part of the pilot because I'd love your voices to be part of the feedback in the formation of these tests to make sure that they don't turn around and compress what we're most valuing into something that can be assessed on a computer or a pen and paper test. And so um, I'm relieved that you're taking part in that process and I'm relieved that it's only 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's time. We're dabbling um, in it, yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be spent on that. Um, and I was also um, really happy to hear that some of the assessments that you're building are process-based. So you're looking at what they've learned through what they can do and documenting that. So I guess that didn't turn into a question. <laughs> Sorry, I was. Um, and my other question is, we've heard a lot about collapsing levels in the high school, and I was wondering how that interacts with these courses and how that's going to play out. So um, we are currently, now that we have looked at the budget and have figured out the number of sections that we need, we are looking at slowing down the collapse of levels and having it be more gradual so that next year it would be for the ninth grade biology classes. Mm. And then we would work our way through 10th grade the following year and 11th grade, just as it, it seems like a more natural flow um, so that students who are coming into the high school and have always been in those collapsed levels will proceed through in science um, as they move through the high school. And so, I think your question was, how will that play out here? We are also in the process of figuring out what PD we need in order to do differentiation well within these classes. And so are hoping that those decisions will be made soon so that teachers will have the resources that they need um, in order to be successful those more heterogeneously grouped classes. Thank you. One, one of the, the issues that we were looking at specifically with science um, in the upper grades, as Marianne mentioned, is, is two things. First of all, that it's reliant somewhat on some math um, mm -hmm. and its connection to the, to the math and those courses that are leveled. Um, 
and also sort of it's sort of hard to describe but even the past experiences of those students and the mindset that they have um, we're really eager to make sure that this works well with the ninth grade those students have never had that uh, have never been in a level course for that um, and when we realized um, recently that given the constraints that we have with the number of sections and the number of uh, FTEs that we have if that's doable we said well let's see if that's doable for mm -hmm. that upper grade level especially grade 11 and it looks like it is and so we're in the process right now of exploring and making that possible um, bottom line is we want to make sure that this is successful for our kids and that we support our teachers as we go along with this um, and just as I mentioned <coughs> we have more students than ever taking physics, and we're so excited about that. And so we really want to figure out what's working at that conceptual physics level and how do we transfer that so that the students are getting that same experience in, and you know, willing to stay the course in an extremely challenging science course at the high school. Yeah. Well, I'd like to just stay with the same topic. So do you understand that, so we're keeping math as CP and SCP levels discrete in ninth grade, right? And that's, I mean, it's not a Correct. science question. For next year. The same students are gonna be in these science classes and those math classes. And then you're saying the biology then we're gonna collapse CP <coughs> and SCP, but not chemistry, physics, and all these other courses, just biology next year in ninth grade. Um, I'm looking to see Some of the courses, like Intro to Engineering next year will actually only be SCP and Honors level. So they will no longer have the SCP level. But some of the engineer, like the Principles of Engineering and the Interactive Device Design and History and Science currently have students um, can take it for SCP or honors level credit, and that will remain the same. But a lot of those other courses that are up there are already at the strong college prep level. One that's changing is environmental issues, and next year it will only be the strong college prep level. So I want to understand what's changing. So the biology, you're going to have students who could be in a CP or an SCP section having access to a single biology course, which would this year be split into CP, SCP, but next year is just gonna be whatever you're gonna call it, some kind of combined Correct. Uh, class. We'll keep the honors class, the honors class for that. So Correct. we'll have effectively two layers of biology in ninth grade, right? So the new thing that's changing is that we'll have some students from CP math, some students from SCP math sitting together in a biology class being taught in the same class, right? That's Correct. what's new. Yes, okay. that will be new. And then anything else that's new up there for next year? And then we're going to reassess, I assume, at the end of the year and decide how to best progress through the other grades. Is that what you're saying as far as collapsing CP As of SCP? now, the plan is that at next year, chemistry will collapse levels, and then the following year, physics will collapse levels. OK. And so you'll, again, you'll have that same opportunity for students who would be in CP or SCP math to participate in a combined classroom for 10th right. grade. So it'll be the same core cohort of students as they move through are going to start ninth grade with a collapsed biology track, we'll call it if they're CP or SCP. They'll then move on to the same format in 10th grade, 11th grade. That's the intent is to follow that cohort all Correct. the way through. That's all I have on that one. I have others. Question. Here. Yes. Hi. So, yeah, again, I want to echo what uh, Chuck said. It was an excellent presentation. Thank um, you. Very glad to hear that it's skills based as opposed to concept based, and make a great point that the concepts can change or the content can change dramatically from year to year as it has. Um, how, how often do K through five students have science right now? That's a good question. Um, so at this point, they are receiving, um, and oh, okay, so uh, they're receiving uh, sixty minutes a day, either science or social studies in three through five. Am I quoting my instructional minutes correctly? And and I believe it's thirty 
in K2. So um, they're getting about a half an hour K2 and about an hour, three, five, but that's science social studies shared. So how do they do that? Creatively and in using integrated techniques. So uh, similar to the way that they would do it, they'll, um, they'll sometimes they'll alternate themes. So they'll, they'll do science for a block of time. For example, I, I'm thinking, for example, in my fifth grade, um, they'll spend a block of time on a unit within science and then they'll put that aside for a bit, do a block of time within social studies. Um, some teams have done that they're switching. For example, my fourth grade, um, they'll go and have a half an hour class in social studies, a half an hour class in science, another one's doing a half an hour um, study in like um, intensive writing and vocabulary, and then they'll switch for those blocks. So different grades and different schools have integrated in different ways. Mm -hmm. So when they do do uh, specialized teaching, yes. is it separate? It's taught separately? It's, uh, it's depends, it also depends on the school. I, it, at Barrows, I can speak to Barrows, we have a science, social studies, fifth grade teacher, a math, and a reading. Um, and then they're all teaching writing across. So our science, social mm -hmm. studies teacher is using that block that would equate to the equivalency of the amount of time. In the How much time did No Adam, what, um, what's their recommended amount of time? I would defer to Craig with some more of those specific. Yeah, I need to look. I believe it's an hour. Um, a day? Yeah. I mean, which is tough, mm. um, and I think it's aligned to the to the standards. Even the state framework gives a recommendation. Let me see if I can flip to the right page at the beginning. And I think, as with anything, there's a bit of that balance that you're finding. And no, I'm sorry. They say, I'm sorry, uh, Heather. They say the state standard says to work in. See, it's my cold medicine. There's 35 minutes a day. Um, is the recommended, yeah, yeah. So I was looking at the weekly. We are, yeah. and, and that's, I mean, if you took any curriculum that's published and did them all purely within the amount of time they said, there's that, you know, you know, that wouldn't really be feasible. And I think the other piece too, if we're doing it well, you're not capturing it just in that block. You're referring to it in the nonfiction reading you're doing during reading block. You're writing about it in your writing class. You're having discussions about it in your class discussion. So if you're doing it well, it's not only happening in whatever that block of time is, that it's touching upon all parts of your day. So you should be doing two or three different content areas. I, I should be applying math and my writing and my reading in my science. So yes, there's a preserved time when you're maybe doing some of that pure initial introduction, but that's where that, if we're thoughtfully integrating, you can't just capture it as one minute in time as doing this, this one thing in a pure way. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so, does the standards have grade level outcomes or expectations? They do, yep. And it, and it truly is grade level by grade level in the Massachusetts um, standards. Yeah. Like for instance, you know, uh, even in, even at the middle level, instead of a grade span of six, of six, seven, eight, middle level, it's got yeah. grade six, grade seven, That's grade eight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's it. Few more questions. Um, I'll stick with the, the grade school level. Sure. So this year is the second time through no Adam for the fifth graders. Yes. But it's the first time through for the third and fourth graders. That depends. So in different schools, different teachers in our very first year said I'd be willing to pilot. Mm -hmm. So for some of them it's their second time, for some of them it is their first. Have you gotten any feedback from teachers in fifth grade who are teaching science to students who are in a pilot program in fourth grade saying that those students approach the format differently or more engaged, less engaged? Yeah, that dialogue has come up at PLC meetings and they are finding that, I mean, some of the basics alone of thinking about the scientific method and their awareness of what that is and what does that mean, um, you know, we're thinking through what do good scientists do, what do good engineers do, mm -hmm. that understanding alone um, has really led them to be able to get into it more. And I think what I'm hearing more as well from the teachers is their second round of exposure that they better understand what do what needs to be emphasized, what maybe do I not need to spend as much in-depth time on, what is better to, to build out, and what is sort of something that I'm introducing but I know will be gone into in-depth further. So both the teacher's level of understanding with their multiple years and also the students who have had it for multiple years, I think it's, as with anything, we're gonna be continue to get better at it as are the kiddos. And we're not using the, the gizmos or the stem scopes. That's all older content. That's not. Yeah, the really no atom schools. itself, it comes as a, a really comprehensive program. But I think, I think they said it well. The, the teachers are incredible, and they do a great job of finding ways, the best way to get there. So as with anything, this is a tool to teach the curriculum. The curriculum is you know, driven by the standards. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, no Adam is really rich in resources and what it comes with and, and quite a range of, of resources and opportunities, but our teachers also continue to find what is the best way to get there, what are the best tools, best techniques, and that's what that PLC time, Joanne's done a really nice job of making sure they're thinking, what do we focus on? What are other great books that you could use during reading time that's supporting this topic? So they're, they're thinking beyond just that one piece. So the, the last piece of my grade school I have is that the, the big challenge in grade school is unique to grade school is they, number one, the teachers have to teach many, many subjects to kids that have limited, the most limited attention spans. They're also the most mixed group of kids in terms of home, you know, heterogeneity. And then you have five schools that you need to ensure that the learning experience is consistent across. How do you address those challenges? So you have teachers that have had to wait. You know, it's one piece of their day, to Gary's point. It's you know, maybe 30 or 60 minutes of their day. They've, they're responsible for a whole curriculum. They've got to do that within a, within a single school, but then you've also got to coordinate with the other principals across schools. Can you speak briefly to how you're yeah, addressing that? Yeah, we can take a weekend. We can sit down. At a high level, how do you assess? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think that's, that's the work we're doing, right? I mean, that's where we're starting those conversations in PLCs leading teachers say, here's what I'm finding, here's my experience, what are you finding, what's working well, that collaborative opportunity, you know, it, it's mirroring what we're asking our students to do, to collaborate together to find what is the most efficient and effective way. And what we also know is, it's not necessarily always the same every single year because you have different groups of students who are coming with different experiences and different levels of exposure. So as they get better, we get better. Um, and I think that's again where the work that we're doing right now is we've got our fifth grade teachers, for example, who have had two years of experience with this curriculum, we have middle school who's received some students that have had it, this is where that conversation needs to happen and continue to happen of what is working, what do we need to prioritize, what are those focus areas, what are those supplemental connected tools that are the best you know, supports for our students. But as with anything, um, you're never gonna have the same class or same student every year. So we have to make sure that our teachers have that core foundation and resources but we give them the leeway to work with the kids that are in front of them. So that's where there's that, those common conversations, those common access to resources, and those dialogues that are gonna push them, to push each other to get, continue to get better. Um, and I think that the structures of the collaborative work with the teachers and our ongoing dialogues about it, we're learning this as we go too. Um, and, and where it's gonna help to see as our students go up, what are they finding is working well, where are there potential areas of gaps, and how can we continue to collaborate? So. Yes. Um, I keep thinking about what a colossal shift this is in thinking and approach and um, how thrilled I am that we have the PLCs because you're able to learn. It's not like, okay, we learned it, now we can just do it. You're learning as you go, like you said, not only about the curriculum but also applying it with different groups of kids and different individuals. And one of my questions is, in the, and, and you've said something about this. I, I'm thrilled that you have a whole district view of this so that I remember when, and I'm dating myself, when there were different curriculums that were implemented early on and then it would sort of end and there wouldn't be that continuity to the middle school or to the high school. And I'm hearing that you're approaching this differently. You're making sure that when the kids learn a certain way of thinking, they're not gonna be abruptly faced with a shift back mm -hmm. to the old way of thinking. On the PLCs, I hear that it's across the grade levels. I mean, across within the grades, the, the teachers that are working on like the fifth grade science. Is it also vertically? so that they're on the PLC, there's someone in fourth, fifth, and sixth, or sixth and, or you know, that fifth to seventh, or that sixth to ninth. Yeah. You know I, I, think, I think, well, I think two pieces, and then I'm sure that middle school can add to it. I mean, I think one, I don't wanna, I don't wanna imply that the only time the teachers are having these conversations is the PLC, because the reality is these teams are working together with each other every day. They're like, I just tried this, you wanna do this. I mean, they're sharing within buildings, they're sharing within grade levels and across. So that, that's just something that they do because they're good teachers. So that, that's always happening. The PLC gives a formal environment for it, but it's, it's not the only, um, because PLCs are also only a representative group. So um, the, some folks teaching the science curriculum you know, the no item curriculum are on it, and some are on other PLCs. So there, that collaboration within buildings and across 
is, is important. Currently in the elementary PLC, there are, um, there are the grade ranges across, and what would tend to happen is they would do check-ins with each other, share some strategies, and tend to break off into grade level groups to talk. We haven't yet, at least the elementary to middle, haven't yet bridged that vertical conversation, partially because we're still getting our feet under us and learning what do we know, what do we not know, what questions do we have. I, I think that would be a wonderful goal to, to think about those bridge years especially. Just, I'll speak to that too, kind of being in the middle. Um, <clears throat> you know, we as a PLC leader, I've met with the elementary. Um, last year, we visited a fifth grade teacher who was using No Adam and, and kind of just went into a conversation with her about how things have been vertical, um, talking to Marianne a lot. But I think one of a, a benefit would be to have, you know, we are limited with time. We have these PLCs once a month, but two, and, and Craig, you know, for your ears, but. You know, have, have a vertical science alignment, social studies alignment, so, you know, we can kind of see what elementary school is doing that we can kind of carry into, and then, you know, at the high school end can carry into, like, are we still teaching the scientific, are you guys still using the scientific method, or, like, what's the skills that you're using at the high school with the expectation for us to prepare, and then how is the elementary preparing for middle school so we can get that nice flow, and I think what No Adam is doing beautifully is really setting up our students to learn how to, you know, work in collaboration with groups, work with their hands, work in inquiry, not just getting the answers from their teachers, you know, but figuring it out. So when they get to the middle school, that's second nature to them. And then when they get to the more complicated classes in high school, you know, they're already ready to go with, you know, being these problem solvers, which is a huge problem in itself, is, is trying to make, the, you know, these kids problem solvers. So I think what's happening organically in itself is that, but it would be nice in the future. And as Heather said, it's hard because we are just starting these PLCs. Uh, they're still fairly new, but to figure out a way with timing to be able subject-based, you know, for us to meet on, uh, you know, the elementary to middle to high school, just to see what we're all doing, you know, to get on the same skill set. That, and just for me to add, that's a definite next step. You know, um, our goal would be to have sort of vertical literacy, math, and science team. <coughs> Excuse me. We have been able to do some of that this year with literacy, ELA, and math, where the two couple of the levels have come together. Um, we've begun this year just by making sure that they're scheduled at the same time so that if, if people, it's, it's easier for us to arrange a vertical time for it. Um, but that's definitely a next step as we go forward, especially in science. We're kind of in the process of getting the nuts and bolts in place mm -hmm. and then really looking at the, the vertical articulation. But um, no, I mean, they've been, it's, it's a huge challenge for a district like us, and we couldn't do it without, you know, these and other people that you mentioned. I mean, everyone who's a part of it, but all the teacher leaders. Um, so Thank you. we're on the way. Yeah. And there's a very strong desire, as Kim and Heather just mentioned, to have that vertical alignment. My teachers say it, or you know, to have those conversations. It's just been a matter, as we're getting started, of logistics. Mm -hmm. logistics. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Nick, you guys. Yeah, so Sarah, it's your turn. Uh, so the, the middle school. So do we get the prepackaged consumables by grade level the way we do in the elementary school for no other? No. Um, we decided not to go that route. It is an option through the STEM scopes, the Rice University. Um, but our teachers at the middle school, there was a, a lot of conversation around not wanting to have anything too pre-prescribed um, because there's a lot of creativity and knowledge base of those teachers because that is their skill set. So they really wanted... They didn't want to have to all do X, Y, and Z all in alignment all at the same time and wanted some flexibility. So we are definitely using our own building-based budgets to provide supplies mm -hmm. and are really encouraging them to pre-plan for those hands-on things and what can we, <coughs> what, what, what resources do they need, but more kind of year by year in the moment and the building level rather than get something coming in the mail. So. Okay. And then so we instead invest in these these online tools we just saw, the iGizmos and STEM scopes. And so that's, is that kind of like a menu for teachers to draw from that's aligned with the curriculum and maybe it, it is. Kim, so this is more for you. But they're all aligned yeah. with the math standards, which is great. Um, and so again, teachers, they've been sharing a lot of information and they have a lot of great stuff that they've developed over the years because our textbooks prior to this maybe 
preceded our superintendent. Um, when same, he year. same year. Same year. Okay. So, same year as a, as a teacher, not as a Same year as a teacher. Eighties. <laughs> so a lot thirty years ago. A lot has been developed over the time that we didn't just want to throw out because it's good stuff. So we're using a lot of the stuff that's been developed, but a lot of the resources online and kind of pulling what what interests the teachers. I think like the PLCs have really created a phenomenal alignment between the two middle schools that we didn't have before. I think it used to be just teachers kind of focusing more on what they were familiar with or more comfortable with and maybe less on less and the conversations going on. There's just natural collaboration, a lot more alignment between the two schools about what's going on and yet still that flexibility based on teachers and their, their excitement. So. Question about the transition as well, if that's okay. Um, so <clears throat> I just want to make sure that I understand how we're doing the transition from the um, pre no Adam to no Adam. So we rolled out sixth grade no Adam. So this is sixth grade. No McGraw Hill. McGraw Hill. So yeah. sixth. I'm sorry. So it's not no Adam that yeah. does the the combination of physical life and earth science. It's what do you call it? Just integrated curriculum. Yep. Is that what you call it? Yep. Like spiral. Yep. Spiral curriculum. Well, so no Adam, no Adam does that too. I mean, any right. of the stuff that we're using. In that, integrates right. all three disciplines. Into, so we're, into we're not using no Adam in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. No, no. just three, okay. four, five. Oh, it's three, four, five. Okay, so the it's just the integration to align with the Mass 2016 standards. Okay, and so we've done that sixth grade one year, and now this year we're doing it in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. This year we're doing sixth grade, and so those students who have the integration this year, when they move on to seventh grade next year, we'll have, we'll the, have integration. the integration. So next year seventh. Through Currently, the seventh grade teachers are still teaching life science. And so next year, the students from sixth grade will again have the integration in their standards. And then by the time they get to eighth grade, my year, uh, they'll have the integration again. So I will be doing an integration in two years. So next year, I'll still be doing Earth and Space um, for the last class. And then the following year, for the integrated students who started in sixth grade, will then get that again. So it's only the group that started in sixth grade this, this year, year that's going to get the spiral curriculum Correct. all the way through. The other, this year's seventh and eighth graders will stay on the, right. the, the traditional, we'll call it, the former the foundation of that life sciences, then our science. Already. So we're not going to have anybody who, I just want to make sure that this doesn't happen, where we have a student that is in the middle of that sixth, seventh, or let's say seventh or eighth grade, and instead of getting, I don't know, the full earth science experience in eighth grade, they get the piece of earth science that's in the spiral curriculum for eighth grade, but they never got the piece of spiral earth science that was in sixth and seventh. Do you see what I mean? Right. So that's not going to happen. We're not going to, students aren't going to miss. They'll, they'll get all the of the concepts. So the sixth grade now will get chunks of those concepts throughout the three years. Whereas the traditional, as you call it, year, they would get all of the concepts in sixth grade, then all of the concepts in seventh for life, and then all of the concepts for eighth grade. So, so they get everything through the course of three years, but now what we're doing is we're just chunking it so it's all throughout you know, the different disciplines of the science. Essentially, the students who s started with that pancake or layer cake approach will finish that eighth grade. Mm -hmm. The ones who entered sixth grade this year who are getting the integrated will continue with the integrated, and that, in a planned way, will coincide with them then taking the new MCAS, which will that be the integrated model. So the students taking the eighth grade pilot are gonna be the, <coughs> on the, what they're do we wanna call it, the spiral or not <coughs> spiral? <coughs> they're, they're in the pancake. They're, they're, they're in the, they're in the end okay. of their third, third year of just having done earth science. So we'll get, year. and then the first students to take the, the official MCAS 2.0 science eighth grade will have gone through the spiral curriculum right. all the way through. So you'll have some data there to compare, albeit imperfect, the effect of the spiral curriculum. Well, one thing too to note is that the seventh and eighth grade teachers who aren't spiraling this year or next, or even eighth grade next year are still using the new resources, which are still that inquiry-based um, approach. So it's not like they're, mm -hmm. they don't have the blinders on and just kind of stay in the course to the, you know, and it, it, not that it was ever really like that, but it, it, they're part of the discussion with the, about the spiraling and they're digging into the resources and, and really starting to shift some practices even though the spiraling isn't necessarily in place. So. Just have a clear before, I know you have other yeah, questions. Yeah, clear. So the pilot is this June. When will the actual test come out the, as a result of the 
So it would be this, all right. The current sixth grade. Current sixth grade, yeah. yeah. And then, no, I was going to switch to high school. I'm ready. I'm working my way through the, <laughs> through the years here, but I'm moving Marianne as fast as I can. So, Marianne, one of, one of the things that strikes me that you said to, was the, enroll, I think you said 18% female enrollment in, mm. presumably that's non-required science or? The, it, that's just for engineering. Oh, the Specifically engineering. the engineering courses. Yes. And I think one thing that skews that data a little bit is that in the digital electronics course, mm -hmm. um, which only ran two years, the average was 7% girls. Mm -hmm. So that brought it down somewhat. It's, it's interesting because it varies significantly from year to year, and there's no rhyme or reason. Like this year, um, we have in principles of engineering, mm -hmm. over 50% of the students are females. Mm -hmm. But last year, I think the number was in the 20s. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I don't know, we can't really explain why there's that fluctuation. What, you mentioned that there were some efforts with business partnerships, um, other ways of community involvement. Can you, wh what I'm curious about is we're one of the premier locations in the world mm. to be in, at least in the industry I'm in, which is biotech, right? People move here from all over the world to work here in the Boston area and they stay here. And what, what I was wondering is if we, so I had a conversation with a uh, Reading High alum who worked at a company that I, that I worked for. And she made a comment that, you know, I wish I knew that I could do the job that I do when I was in high school. Mm. I wish I knew it existed. And that there are so many different, I in the line of work, any kind of very technical work, there's so many s you know, s different ways that people contribute to just the technology we have in this room. Uh, and so I'm wondering, do you see any opportunities where we can you know, as, as a school committee or, you know, as a community can partner with you. And, and I think it's tied to the, the female enrollment issue because this is a, this is a statistic also in, in the professions, right? So as a chemist, I was went to the chemist by training. Female enrollment in my graduate school was like probably under 10%. Um, I, I don't know why. Um, and then when you get in and become a research chemist, it, it doesn't approach 50%, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know why that is. Um, there are different you know, hypotheses you could make. I'm wondering, though, whether these two things, like whether there's <coughs> an opportunity here to have people speak to students about this is how what you do in ninth grade biology relates to what I do every day and leads to life-saving outcomes for what we do as a business enterprise, as opposed to kind of going on site somewhere and just kind of seeing a business, having someone, perhaps an alum, or someone come and, and speak to students at different grades and trying to diversify it so you have people that have been out of school for maybe two years or 10 years or 20 years at, at different levels, and especially focusing in, in the STEM area on underrepresented groups within STEM, not just female, but any group that's underrepresented. I, I think, I wonder if part of it is that we don't have the opportunities to make the connections that people make for, for whatever reason that lead to mentoring and lead to encouragement and lead to a, hey, this person did it, so can I. So can you speak to the, what, how, how we or the community could help you and the department to create more of those opportunities? Sure, I mean, I love the idea of having people in the community come and serve as guest speakers. And I know that that happens on a small scale at the moment. I know that Frank Bono, one of the chemistry and engineering teachers has former students who I know Ashley Testa is just one example of a student who was at Northeastern and so she comes back every year and talks to his students. Um, I teach the history and science of epidemic disease elective and so we have former students come in and talk about service learning trips that they've taken in order to encourage those opportunities for our students in college. Uh, Elaine Webb has actually helped me to coordinate women in STEM luncheons. Craig's wife was actually one of our keynote speakers at those. And on those panels, um, we have had lots of alum come. But again, these are like one-shot deals. And so I think the more that's, and so we have had discussions within our department about 
expanding the number of these opportunities and also our focus up for that luncheon for example was on women in stem you know and so we talked within the department about expanding that because as you mentioned sometimes students just don't even know the fields that are available to them i i had a few students this year write as their ref their final reflection that taking history and science of epidemic disease opened their minds to so many other professions in the field of science that they never thought about before in public health mm -hmm. fields or epidemiology. And so um, I thank you and definitely would look forward to having people in the community in to talk to students about opportunities more regularly and we're hoping to run that panel again next year and to expand some of those, and especially now we're hoping with the flex block that we have at the high school that we might utilize those opportunities too, to possibly have people come in and talk about professions that students might not think about when they're in high school. So thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation. Sure. Yeah. Question for Dr. Doherty, if you wanna know. Sure. Help us follow the money. So we've had two um, allotments, I'll call that, of 150,000 in the last. There's one, one this year from town meeting, and then there was one the year before. Um, where is that money in everything we're hearing here? I mean, just roughly speaking, not to the penny, but give us a sense, and people in the community who may be asking, this is a great presentation, to Chuck's point, what, is, what, is, what are the dollars supporting? Is it, is it teacher time? Is it consumables for the grade school? Is it the iGizmo license so the teachers have this online resource? Is it something else? Help us understand that. So everything you heard tonight is being funded through either last year's money or this year's money that was uh, approved by town meeting. Um, the no Adam in grades three through five, uh, the, the first year of implementation, which was this year, the consumables and the durables were paid for out of last year's uh, 150,000, along with pilot for um, grade six, I'm um, sorry, the grade six material and then grade seven, eight pilot. So how much of that is consumables will have to keep buying every year? So that's embedded in the per pupil for the buildings. So that's that 680K per building. Uh, it's not 680. 680 it's part, of, it's part yeah. of that. It's not. No, I know it's not the whole thing, but it's they part of that. They wish it was. Yeah, it's not 680. <laughs> I wish it was 680. That's the total aggregate. Don't forget, we had to reduce that next year as part of the $150,000 cut. I, the, but I want people to see, like, if they say, where's the money? I want them to understand that it's part of a lot of things, right? So it's part of that. What you'll see is a building per pupil fund, and that adds up to a number. Part of that number is is... The consumables the, uh, the, that we talked about, the, the durables. The 150, the 150 for last year and this year is paying for the durables, okay. some of the technology um, that you heard about in the middle school, uh, some of the training. Um, that's going to continue this year. Um, we're going to be purchasing some materials in K-2. We're going to start doing some work in, in high school. That's what's happening with the 150 that, that you're hearing about uh, that was passed at town meeting in April. So is it fair to say it's it's part of building budgets, it's part of FTE costs for science teachers, and it's part of PD? No, the 150 is not FTEs. Not FTE time. No, so we don't break out their science time and put it over there at all. No. It's just curriculum, durables, consumables, plus PD? Is that, some PD. Is that where it is? Some PD. Anywhere else? Just those two? Technology. And technology fund. Okay, those, three, those three line items are where that 150 is going in our, in our budget. Yeah. You could say in order to support, I, I can speak to the middle school level, the, the uh, resources that you've seen, the iGlenco, mm -hmm. the Gizmos, the um, STEM scopes, which are all digital platforms, which we're moving away, obviously, from textbooks uh, to keep current. Um, we noticed that we need to have a set of laptops in the classroom. So a lot of that money, it's expensive. Half carts are going to classrooms to be able to actually do these things, too. So that's part of our technology that's budget. Part of the technology budget. So people yeah. say, oh, I can't find it in the budget. This is to help them understand where to look, right? right. So we look technology, we look at PD, we look at. Um, so, you know, not because I know, I know we need to move on to another presentation, but when we make cuts in those areas, it has an effect. Yeah, yeah and you have to allocate that among multiple right. programs, and this is one of them. Mm. So that's very helpful. 
Thanks again. This was great. great. Thank, Thank you for having us. Thank you. update for some things we've done through the end of last year and beginning of this year. Um, and I'm not going to go through and read everything to you because you already have it, so I'll just hit some key points and give you an opportunity to ask some questions because I know your night is moving along very quickly. Um, we've really focused, um, in, the, in the past six years, our school lunch sales, specifically lunch, have declined 15%. And I attribute that to um, most of the stipulations that were made in 2010 with the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. Lots of changes with portion sizes, requirements that have things that need to be on the tray, um, limitations with uh, how we can menu things like we have to do 100% whole grains, sodium restrictions, um, and then the portion sizes that have changed over the years. So as all of those things have been phased in, we've seen our lunch counts drop and we've been battling against that, trying to um, do quite a bit with professional development, re uh, recipe development, menu enhancements. And um, we've done okay financially, so we're, we've been reinvesting the dollars back into the program, trying to um, have a more restaurant feel, uh, try enticing the students to eat the food and not be forced to take the food, uh, really making it a choice versus a, a requirement. So we spent some time, and I know Linda um, had come down and we uh, very nicely helped us get in the paper um, to show what we had done at the high school. Um, one of the students named the new high school the launch pad, and uh, we designed a lot of the um, different things in the high school with the administration and the students. So keeping obviously with the Reading Rockets color theme, but did a lot of that. We kind of brought that through different parts of the um, cafeteria level of the floor, um, school floor, even up into the stairwell to try to highlight where we were. Just basically really working with the managers every month. We have a monthly managers meeting uh, discussing uh, different leveled things with the students, but trying just fun stuff repackaging some of the food into some Chinese food containers. Same food, updated recipes, new packaging, things of that nature. This is a small picture here, but we had hired um, a new manager a year ago this past November, and she's been amazing about marketing. And if you walk into the kitchen, there's some pictures here, but this was just, we did opening day with the Red Sox, and she had a hot dog in the menu. So she created a top your own hot dog bar. I mean. Something very simple. All the condiments we always have, she just made it fun. Um, and the kids are really <coughs> responding. Some of the money that's been talked about in the past, about the uh, money in the revolving fund, we do need to keep the money there for um, all of the repairs and the equipment upgrades, but we're really investing back in. Uh, almost every building has gotten new things. Kill them. We put a lot of money into this year, but and we're, we're probably going to put some more in before the end of the year. Um, just updating and keeping things going so that they have a longer life. Um, and just for the, for the staff, we worked with the bargaining unit and uh, uh, implementing a new evaluation tool for them to, to continue to try to drive a goal setting um, evaluation for them so we improve every year. Um, I, I, it's too bad Heather left, but um, Heather and I have worked with Mrs. Ferguson um, for several years, and um, I was nominating her for Manager of the Year, and she was nominating her for Hero of, of the State of Massachusetts, and she won. So she won, um, 
and, and I'm not sure if we'll be doing anything else at the school or at the district. I, I don't even know if she won the national award, but she won the state award for manager of the year. She won the regional award for manager of the year. So it's um, nine states out of the um, uh, out of the country, and then she's one out of possible winners for national. I don't know when they announced that, but. She is going to the national conference uh, with me this summer, as well as um, another uh, person in our staff, to walk the red carpet in Atlanta. So she'll she'll get her award from the national president of the School Nutrition Association. But that's her there with a the young man from her school, uh, <coughs> got permission from the parent for the picture, and uh, it's just kind of it's kind of a big deal. So I figured it got its own slide. Uh, Doing a lot of marketing, just fun stuff. This is all your people. That's um, Barrows at the top for Dr. Seuss Day and celebrating the Patriots and um, the Killam. That's the Parker and the Killam. Just some fun stuff. Always trying to just make it fun to be in the CAF and learn about food. Um, this is a big deal. We worked for a couple of years on this. Uh, the NutriSlice app is. Um, it's a, it's a piece of software that we purchased through the program. We pay basically a per pupil amount on it and students and parents can log in. And there's a mobile app as well as a computerized app for the, and what we've worked on is Carling Samen is when I did do take over Wakefield and Reading, we restructured. So Carling is what's a nutrition site coordinator. She's working on a lot of the nutritionals, ingredient labels, um, the menus, um, the orders for all the schools. But this particular app that we have, this was just a screenshot so you can see that you can go in and look at a menu. But the really interesting things is we've been working collaboratively with the nurses because the unfortunate thing in our society right now is we do have a lot of students that have some certain diseases that we, we didn't use to have to deal with as significantly as we do now and diabetes is one of them. So they're doing carb counts and they're, they're identifying how much insulin a child needs either before or after they've eaten. In a school setting where you have your one nurse and you have all these kids and all these problems, it's a very nerve-wracking thing to try to do. And we have limited staff in the buildings for limited hours, so trying to get that information, make sure the kids got the right portion, did they eat it, did they not eat it. This has offered us the opportunity to provide them with some information at a moment's notice. We post it, they can see it. They'll still collaboratively work with each manager, but Carlene's been able to use the software and the free training that came with it to really drill down each building to have their own menu, their own specifics. Have a little bit of entrepreneurship. You know, Barrows might not like what Killam likes. Parker and Coolidge have their own idiosyncrasies, so they can contour their menus and we can still provide the information that parents want. Phase two next year, we're looking to load um, the ingredient labels so that when you hover over one of these menu items you should be able to see what's in it so it'll it'll hit the allergy piece as well as the nutrition piece as well as like hey if you're on Weight Watchers and you want to figure out your points you might be able to do that too um, but we also worked with a, a Reading graduate Erica Coneglia had um, she was graduating and she was getting her um, she wanted to be a registered dietitian and she need they have to do intern uh, hours, and so she did her uh, food service rotation with us, since she was instrumental in helping us do that. So I, this is, we went to the, we brought her with us to the fall um, School Nutrition Association show in Mass, and so that's Erica on the left. So uh, it was nice to have um, a Reading graduate be able to come back and um, work on that. So we'll hopefully get to see her again if, uh, if she wants to go into schools. This is just some more evidence of what they're doing at the high school. They, I specifically highlighted them because she took every opportunity that we did something fun on the menu and she made it a blast for the kids. So she had them decorate their own gingerbread cookie and she filled up a jar with little mini marshmallows and had a contest for some prizes of iTunes gift cards or Barnes and Noble or something for the kids to guess what was in the jar. It was really just in hopes to get kids into the kitchen to try to get them to see what was for lunch. Um, and she really made it, I meant to bring it and I left it in my office. Um, she made a big deal at graduation. She decorated the whole calf. She put up this sign-in wall where the kids could put where they were going to school and really celebrate that they were um, all heading somewhere great. And she got, made them each a handmade diploma with a little um, fun message about needing a pen. And she bought some inspirational pens where they turn them in it keep them motivated and the thank you. And they, the school brought them down um, 
to get them as a special treat for them on their last day of lunch. So it was a lot of fun, and, and I think that's what's going to keep us going. In a, in a, in a district where um, Dr. Darty really talks about highly qualified professionals in every area, food services um, is not limited in this area. We've attended all of our trainings like we normally attend, but we've, we've added several more. The United States Department of Agriculture now has a mandate, also through the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, that no matter how many, if you work two hours in food service, you're required four hours of professional development, no matter what. So uh, I'm just proud that they've put in as many hours as they have, 347 hours for about 30, 30 permanent employees is, is pretty good. And um, I think you have some of the highly, most highly qualified professionals in, in our department in this state. Some of these things we've done year over year, some we pick up new things, but uh, we participated in the Festival of the Trees, the Taste of Metro North again. Tomorrow I will be going to the um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's Healthy Summit. It's an annual meeting where the Department of Education kind of updates us on everything that's going on and then they ask us to pick a track that they want some professional development, usually because of upcoming standards or new laws or something. So I'll be going to that the next two days. I'm gonna be presenting on Wednesday for them through the Smarter Lunchrooms Initiative, which um, is something we participated in Reading last year, and we participated in Wakefield this year. It was an um, opportunity to put your name in for some free coaching and mentoring and um, so we're gonna, we're gonna help them identify to other school districts how they can use some of these strategies that are a lot of times free. It's just knowing the right thing to do and talking to them about a director's perspective. And I uh, was asked to speak at Harvard University. Um, they're having a Healthy fuel, <coughs> Food Fuels Hungry Minds conference on June 7th. You're all welcome to go, or if you know other people who aren't in the food service industry who'd like to know about how um, how uh, school nutrition is funded. The session that I'm working with is understanding the school food funding for non-school nutrition directors. So it's just in an effort to try to help people understand. It's really confusing where it's an entitlement program. It has state funding, it has grants, it has, and you're collecting cash, and people get very confused about how all that works. And um, through the School Nutrition Association nationally, they asked me to, um, help them with a financial task force. People in my position have limited resources available to help us manage the accounting of what we do. And we're managing millions of dollars of federal and state monies and local money. And so we're, we're kind of creating some documents that will help people in my position be able to do a better job about managing the business and staying out of the red, where a lot of communities have fallen into the negative situation and, and what ends up happening is that that budget that you want the money for the science program and we want you to have it because we want those registered dietitians to come out and work for us they have to give us money to, to balance the budget and we don't want that so we want to educate them we are we ex we intend to remain solvent in our uh, revolving fund i see no evidence that anything would be any different this year um, we're continuing to provide all of the free and reduced meals um, through the school nutrition program. The interesting thing for us is we raised, we were forced, once again, through the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, we were forced to raise our prices last year, even though from a customer perspective, we didn't want to. We, we needed to, to be in, co in compliance with the law. That usually you have a huge dip in, in sales when that happens. From the average daily attendance, we have a flat percentage it's less in numbers and meals, but we're serving the same percentage of kids' lunches, which is good. So that's actually better than we had estimated. Um, but our revenue, and our revenue has gone up, which you, we would have expected with the price increase. So the, the actual dollar value has gone up. Breakfast participation is down. I'm not surprised. They pushed me a date on that as well. So um, that it continues to be a challenge. We have never had um, a really strong breakfast participation. Our breakfast participation is limited. The kids just aren't really in the buildings that early. A lot of times it's the kids who are going early in the morning with drop off that's available. Um, some of the kids who come in from Boston, they really start early, they need that breakfast. So we're there, so we'll serve it. As long, since we're there anyway, we're not gonna probably take anything away. We just, it's an area we've tried to. 
Would, can you just jump back to that? So what is this? the, uh, yeah, the, the, yes, the third bullet down. Uh, what, what is the, do you know what percentage buy versus bring their lunches? Or? So it's different at every school and every level, but it usually runs around 40% of the kids who are in attendance at elementary in the 35 range at middle school and about a little over 32% at the high school. So that's what we serve. So the others bring their food or they buy something that's a la carte, maybe, meaning they bring something from home and they buy a little from us, but it's not a right. full reimbursable meal. Any, right. uh, any other question? When was that 15% decline you referenced in the Same beginning? Time? She referenced a 15% decline in. So it's been over six years. We actually had an audit from um, the town this year, and one of the things that we had to talk about was one of the pieces in the mandate, which is the equity in school meals pricing. So as part of that, I, I had to document to him what the prices were and where we changed. So it got me into a little statistical analysis, and I started evaluating over the years where our lunch counts had gone. So over the past six years, since the new law went into effect, over that time frame, the school district at large, the lunch, um, uh, the lunch counts have declined by 15%. So it used to be over half? Like if it was 30 to 40% now, it used to be well, over Well, it's not 50. by percentage. It's by, it's, well, I guess maybe if we went back, I didn't look at it by percentage. I was looking at it by the number of meals. So I didn't compare it completely to like enrollment data and all that, but it, it did decline. Like if you were looking at the flat numbers as I was listing how many lunches we served in each year, year over year. Is, is um, I mean, is our goal to sell more lunches or just to provide compliant and healthy lunches for kids who choose to buy them? I think it might be a little bit of both. I mean, for me, from what, what I see as my responsibility is to provide a healthy lunch to the <coughs> students in Reading. I, I think that the lunches that they're going to be able to get from us are far more nutritious and balanced than what I see a lot of kids bring in. Not to say that a lot of kids aren't bringing something that could be very nutritious, but, and actually there is data, and I, I don't have any um, research like written down to read to, but as I, as I read, there's a lot of um, research out there that says the school nutrition departments are offering healthier lunches. So my goal, I'd like to serve all the kids a lunch. Quite frankly, I'd like to serve all the kids a free lunch so that everybody gets the same thing and we don't have all this, um, craziness with uh, worrying about you know who has money who doesn't have money and all that but um, so my goal is to feed them and my I always want to be in compliance but I want to feed them something they want to eat that fuels their minds and bodies to learn that's the goal and do do you have any initiatives or efforts to reduce the amount of added sugar that is in the diet when you serve it or size of sugary beverages or anything like that? Not the oh, kids absolutely. Won't get it. Most of that is right embedded in the law. So the things that are considered a la carte, like we can't sell soda or anything like that. But the Department of Public Health, three, two, three, three years ago, two years ago, um, they enacted their own competitive food guidelines in the state of Massachusetts that superseded the federal guidelines, which are referred to as smart snacks. And so they're stricter than that. So we're very limited in the sugars we're able to offer. There was a whole year in between where we were very, we couldn't even sell anything that was ice cream based because of the way the sugar content was I identified. So th the law, it's embedded in the law. Through our purchasing collaborative, we've made some strides. We're very lucky to have a lot of registered dietitians that work with us in the collaborative that we're in for purchasing. So we're trying to limit things like high fructose corn syrup. The milk that we serve doesn't have that. So although I'm not a registered dietitian and I'm not educated in, this, in that science, we're surrounded by people who really are knowledgeable there. So we're trying to really attack that through the purchasing of, of the foods and, and identifying what is acceptable and what's not acceptable on the bid. I was, I was just going to say I have been fortunate enough to sample <laughs> a lot of your food from the Blue Ribbon Conference, from the Metro North. Um, and I would buy lunch. I would buy breakfast. <laughs> and I like that you're trying to entice them to eat healthy, knowing when you get part of a frenzied lifestyle, it's very easy 
to not eat those meals, and that really can impact the learning. Um, so I appreciate it. And I saw what you had done with the cafeteria, and it's... I can't take credit for any of that. Mrs. Murphy and her staff at the Reading High School, they have been, they have just really been excited about it, and the, the response from the kids was amazing. So it, I, I gotta give them all the credit for that. They did a great job. I appreciate that it all contributes to the school feeling like a home, feeling like it embraces the kids. And that's part of our district goal, yep. is to make it a safe, embracing, nurturing place. That's how we want them to feel. There was a lot of tears on Thursday. I felt so bad for them. They had the whole, all the, and a lot of people hate this word, I, I find it endearing. All the lunch ladies were out there at the, where the, you come up the ramp at the uh, middle of the cafeteria and they were giving them their little pen diplomas and the, the kids were just overwhelmed but they were saying goodbye and it was really sweet, it was really nice, so. So uh, are some of the mandates gonna be relaxed? I think it was. Yes, so I'm hoping, I've read a lot but I really wanna hear it from um, Rob Leshen who's now in charge of the, um, the part of the Department of Ed that we report to and he'll be updating us tomorrow morning, but what they've talked about relaxing is across the country they offered a relaxation on offering flavored milk in uh, a 1% milk. When the mandates were put in place, um, you were only allowed to offer um, non-fat milk that had flavoring. I don't anticipate us changing anything. The bottlers in this area have already kind of switched to those recipes. It's working for us. We're happy just to be able to offer flavored milk for those students who cho choose not to drink milk at all if they don't get flavored milk. So we do have the milk right now in strawberry and coffee and chocolate and vanilla available to us in skim milk with no high fructose corn syrup. My, my preference would be to stay that way. I really haven't had anyone say I need it in 1%. So um, the other one is uh, they did just relax the whole grain piece, so they we were had to serve 100% of the grains that we served had to be 51% whole grain or better. Now they're relaxing that back to half of the grains we serve. It might offer us the opportunity to offer a white pasta here and there. Again, we already have most of the things that we sell have already been we've been doing this with the kids, some of them for seven or eight years, because we started before the, we knew the mandate was gonna come in. So we're not gonna like roll back all the great things that we're doing that aren't a problem. It's just some of the things like our pasta sales, we make homemade gravy at the high school and we package it in five gallon buckets and send it to the elementary schools. I'm talking tomato paste, spices, crushed tomatoes, all of it. Some of the kids really just don't like whole wheat or whole grain pasta. It's a palatability thing. So if we can offer a little opportunity occasionally there, we'd like to do that. But I, I don't wanna go repealing the great things that we've done. There was, oh, the sodium. So the sodium targets were supposed to go to target two, which was really strict. In the research and development in the, in the production of the food, they hadn't caught up with it. So we weren't sure what we were gonna buy because the food isn't out there, it isn't in compliance. And we're already offering a plethora of fresh fruits and vegetables, um, so, we were really nervous about how we were gonna make that work. Uh, it, was, it was gonna be an area of growth for us that we were gonna work on with the Department Ed because it was, it was a huge challenge. So they've kind of put that back at target one, so it's where we are right now. We are fine there, we're excelling there. Um, I'm really not sure what's gonna happen. I mean, this new administration is unpredictable. So, um, <laughs> so we, we are, are nervous about some things like block granting and things like that, which would basically um, take a knife and put it in the side of the tire um, for our programs because it would repeal, it would repeal the, almost everything in the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, but it would eliminate like paid reimbursements. So it would, it would really, it would, it would change the entire picture of what school lunch would look like in a town like Reading because we only have nine or 10% free or reduced students. So the majority of the students who purchase from us are full price paid students. So we would lose any of the funding that we get to help support those lunches. So it would all be coming from the parent. So we would, I, I'm really hoping that that doesn't happen. You have to go back to Turkey Fricassee if you Oh, gosh. <laughs> There's too much salt in that, but. Um, 
Yeah, it would. It would really because it, it would do. It was. No, it would not only take away the funding. It would change. They wouldn't have the standards in place. So it would be back to French fries and soda. And I'm not going there. So. One, yes. one last question. This Nutrislice app, mm. so is that is that something that needs to continually be updated? Like, is, is is there are there resources you need to maintain that, keep that available for parents and students? Carlene is my resource. So yes, it is something that it, it is predicated on having a person who can watch it. So as I develop the recipes with the managers and Carlene, she is like uploading them onto the computer. Some of the stuff is nice that we can set in place, like the daily alternatives or things that aren't going to change. But yes, the monthly menu was updated there, which is also nice for parents because um, posting things quickly is sometimes a challenge for me because we're trying to menu based on what we get. and We don't always know what we're going to get based on the government trucks. <coughs> so um, this is nice because if a parent wants to plot, plan out what they want with their child, it gives us the, it's a little easier to post it into that um, because it's it's a web base that's live whereas with me I'm trying to post things and if I don't have the whole month ready uh, it's a more, more of a challenge is that available to Wakefield as well as Reading basically I haven't done it in Wakefield yet I don't have that support person there and everything is not an exact mirror image over there so I'm not sure that we'll get to that as quickly I've worked a couple years here to get that going and I've only been there four years, and we have some other priorities. Okay. And that, that allows you to see added sugar if you're a parent? I don't know if it says, if it shows added sugar. I think, I think if you hover, I think it, it's the sugars, but don't quote me on that. I would have to, I would have to look at it and check. So to the extent that that's even possible, I think that's helpful for some parents. Right. right. So you get a peach, well, it's got sugar, but that's very different than right. orange juice. Right, absolutely, sugar. absolutely, I agree. I just wanted to say, I just had no idea that the unfunded mandates went also into the food service nutrition department, oh, yeah. that you have to keep up with what the requirements are and what the recipes and the ingredients and how they comply, and it's, it just blows me away. Yeah, the last, in 2010, when they did the mandates, they, they made some mandates that came in with breakfast, but they didn't give us any commodity dollars or any food. So. They required us to, to make the children take a fruit or vegetable whether they wanted it or not, but they didn't give any funding, whether it be through the reimbursement or the USD entitlement food dollars. So, um, you know, it's just, it, they, they're doing, they were doing that a lot with, I think, the right intention. I mean, I think that people in my profession have embraced doing that. I mean, I, I actually, in the other PowerPoint I had to do for um, Wednesday, we were just were showing all the different ways that we offer fruit. And, Dr. Jardy is one of our best customers. He buys a basket of fruit and homemade hummus and our homemade black bean and corn salsa every Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> he does that so that he has healthy options for his guests and his staff. It's a, we, I talk about that all the time. I always say our superintendent is our best customer. And he buys a salad every day. <laughs> he doesn't, doesn't offer it to the school committee. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's lots of unfunded mandates, unfortunately. But we try to work with them, and we try to embrace them. And if they're the right thing for kids, we try to make it work for us. And if they're not, then I go to Washington, and I try to fight to get them to take it back. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank, you. thank you so much. Right, thank you. Yep. I would love to move to authorize the superintendent to enter a new three-year intermunicipal agreement between the Reading Public Schools and Wakefield Public Schools. Keep this woman here. <laughs> Second. Second. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Four zero. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. And anytime you need anything, feel free to call or email or ask Dr. Doherty. So I have Jerry call me. I have Jerry call you? Yeah. No, I said say hi to her for me. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Consent. Uh, yeah. Is there anything anyone would like taken off of the consent agenda this evening? Yep. Hearing I'm nothing, we have a motion. I move to appro approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Second. Hmm. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Four, zero. Thank you. Uh, 
We are at reports. Mario. Well, um, <coughs> so this, uh, not much <coughs> going on, but this Friday uh, is the senior prom. Um, uh, I will, I am, I'm going to it. Uh, I, uh, I don't remember where it is, unfortunately. But, <laughs> Uh, I am going. You'll, you'll find, find out. out. I'll find out. Yeah, I will find out. Um, I think uh, the. Um, I know sports are coming down, like uh, coming down to playoffs. Uh, with the seniors gone. Um, I'm not. Um, I'm not sure how well they're doing. I hope they're doing well. Um, uh, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. And so you're officially a senior. Senior. Uh, the building is a lot. Uh, Lot less people around. Yeah, yeah. Lot less crowded. <laughs> Thank you. Any committee reports? No. No. Yes. Um, just a brief update on the Human Relations Advisory Committee. We met um, and we did not have quorum a couple of weeks ago um, on Thursday, but we met. Um, I assume we're going to get an update from the superintendent and. Um, the group of volunteers that were there recommended to the selectmen um, that the town should do something educational in response um, to the impact of the swastika on the um, floor of the classroom. And so the committee is being called to bring back some, um, some recommendations. So, um, we're looking forward to working on that. And we were scheduled, our usual Thursday meeting is, it coincides with the baccalaureate, but rather we did have a quorum at that point in the meeting and we decided that we would not meet on that night because we do not want to compete with such a wonderful interdenominational diversity oriented service. So um, we are going to come up with a different date for our meeting, which we do not have yet. Craig, you? I don't. I'm all set. You approved mine. <laughs> Dr. Dari. I do have a few things. Um, so I'm going to pass this up, but while the enrollment is being passed around, um, I do want to update the community on the graffiti incident that we had um, on May 5th uh, here at the high school. Uh, so as I read um, in the statement that Mr. Barker had um, at, the, at our last meeting, um, Essentially now the, Mr. Barker has closed his investigation and now the focus is more on um, the education piece for the students and for um, the high school community. And so I just want to highlight a couple of things that have, have happened recently. I think I talked a little bit about it in Mr. Barker's email that he had sent to the community. Um, but on uh, last Wednesday, the 10th, uh, from the time that the, that the incident began, uh, the history department started uh, in their classes to discuss ways to facilitate a dialogue about the, the topic of the graffiti and what it symbolized. Um, they did use Mr. Barker's email as a primary source document, um, and the entire department developed discussion questions that began conversations about tolerance. So they used I, I know this was done in other classes as well, but the history department used it as an opportunity for a teachable moment. Uh, Mr. Barker also met with student leaders from the World of Difference to discuss a presentation that they were going to plan for students and staff, and then they made that presentation um, to staff um, the 17th, which was uh, last Wednesday. And basically that, that presentation focused on a resolution that they have been developing on respect and acceptance uh, to staff of folks to support if interested. And so they are really focusing their efforts on developing a slogan, apparel, signage. Um, those are things that are going to be discussed and moving forward in the, in the future. Um, as part of this, Mr. Barker has also, and uh, administration has been meeting with the different groups of classes. So last Thursday, um, he met with the freshman and junior classes to update them on the events that had taken place, the steps that the school had taken, the importance of maintaining a safe, inclusive school environment, 
that promotes differing opinions but mutual respect and efforts programming going forward that will promote and educate students, staff, and parents about tolerance, diversity, and student voice. And then moving forward, this Thursday, he's going to have a similar class meeting with sophomores. And then next Tuesday, he's going to have a meeting with the seniors um, who will be back for their graduation practice. Um, so he'll be having conversations with the, with the seniors next week. Some of the things that are going to happen um, moving into next year is the resolution, um, which I had mentioned. Um, there's going to be some murals that are going to be going up around the whole focus of respect and acceptance. Um, I know art classes are going to be using. This is an opportunity to develop um, some slogans and apparel and signage. They do plan on using the flex block next year as a way to uh, have discussions about the topics of equity, tolerance, anti-bullying, and mental health issues. So they're going to continue what they've been doing this year. Um, and they are the student leaders um, are going to participate in youth mental health training. Um, so those are some of the things that have been going on. Uh, I did meet with the Reading Police Department last Tuesday to debrief the situation. Uh, we always do this after situations like this and trainings and drills that we do as a, as a district with the police department um, just to check in and see other things that perhaps we, we could have done differently or improved um, in any way. And I think we both walked away, police and the schools, feeling very good about the way it was handled and the way it was it was communicated communicated to the to the high school community. And certainly there's always things we can do differently, but I think you know by following the protocol of the Anti Defamation League um, and the information that Mr. Barker sent out um, on that Monday, I, I think it really set a positive tone uh, on how to address this issue. So that's an update um, on, on that situation. In terms of the enrollment, this is the latest projected enrollment for next year. There are two sides. The first side is the elementary. Um, you can see that <clears throat> with a few exceptions, our, our class sizes look pretty good for next year um, at this point in time I mean during the summer we do tend to get some increases um, but I, I think overall we're, we're, we're keeping school committee guidelines of grades three through five staying in the mid 20s and K to two staying in that 18 to 22 range there is a couple of high spots but um, you know given, given the fact that just we, we just went through some major budget reductions, I think these are, these are very good. Um, when you flip it over to the other side, the one area that, that we are concerned about, and this was not as a result of a budget reduction, is the sixth grade at Coolidge, where the class sizes are going to be um, around 29 um, to 30 next year. Um, so that, that, is, that is an area of concern, and it really is, we, have, we do have a larger uh, middle school class coming in um, from fifth grade and the way that they fell along the redistricting lines um, that combination you know this does this does happen every once in a while where the lines for the most part do work and they they've been in place for several years now and then once in a while we do have um, a bubble class in one middle school or another that um, results in higher class sizes isn't the uh the graduating class, my son's in, that was 28 uh, back when yeah. he was in. In middle school. Middle school. Yeah, that's correct. At the time, that was close to 400 kids. Yeah. So that's an update on the, on the enrollment. Yes. Have, um, I know it used to be that there were um, well, it still is that some children from Coolidge go to Parker and some go to Coolidge. Is there um, is there an option for parents to choose to go to the other, like to go to Parker instead of Coolidge? We did offer that opportunity to all fifth grade families. We do that in January of every year. That's done automatically, um, and you know, this unfortunately, the unfortunately, yeah, we didn't. We weren't able to, uh, the only request we were able to accommodate was the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Coolidge District to Parker. 
the kindergarten at Barrows, are there three kindergarten teachers? Yes, there are. And then both of the, the guidance for first and second grade that we have as a it's a best best practice is to be at was it 22 18 to 22 in first and second that that's our goal sometimes with a goal or don't yeah, reach no, that goal it's a guideline so it's just these two would end classes next yes. year in first and second grade that are above that in in one and two so those do those would end parents get I know our guideline is 18 to 22 we're obviously above that in in those uh, classes at Wood End, do they get an option if they want to drive their own children to another? I'm just they absolutely do. Um, I just I'm not, I'm not yeah no they absolutely I can't remember no they absolutely if they if we we always uh, if parents want to request to move to a different school they always have that option we've always made that available and we grant it based on class size right. I just see, like, if you look at, at close by Birch Meadow, that's lower. lower. And the same for that fourth grade. The four, fourth grade at Wood End is also <coughs> high. 24, 25. When, do you, when would you make a decision? What would be the cutoff? Like, at some point, when you say we have to add another class? What would you expect to see? So let's say um, budget. That. It's going to be very difficult this budget year. Space. I know. But I'm just saying, under normal circumstances, uh, if you had to add a teacher, uh, we're we're approaching that. But you need two things: you need space, and you need you need the funding for another teacher. Right. I'm out, I'm just looking at Wood End. There must be space at Wood End. Um, um, there is an empty classroom at Wood End. Yes, we could, but again, we don't have the funding. Are, are we at capacity on full day kindergarten? The numbers are pretty high in some of the schools. Is there, is there a space constraint on full? All day of these day? classes next year are integrated. Okay, that's what I was going to ask next. All all five schools. It's the first time we've had five integrated classrooms, and really the reason for that is our numbers are so low now for half day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I say that looks like the lowest I think I can be. Yeah. Started. You other questions? No, actually, I didn't this time. Oh, okay. You had no yet your hand up. So. No, it was about the integrated day, whether the, the kindergarten classes were. The only other thing, what was that? Was that it? Yeah. On that? Thanks. The only other thing I had is um, Friends and Family Day is coming up on the 17th of June, and at the next meeting, um, we'll talk about how that's going to work. Gene asked me to mention that in my report. Did you get that, Gary? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you, what time are you going to be there? Yeah. I actually have it on and we are all signed up. <laughs> and uh, we, we are also fast approaching or we actually maybe pass, we've passed today. the deadline or today's it for the evaluation material so. today was the deadline for right. the evaluation yes should get it any minute till midnight um <laughs> i have received one i wonder who that is I mean, my From the, the West person Coast? the person is not here but i'm but i've been promised that there's more along the way That's, the that's it. That's all I have. Uh, is there any motions? Motion, Motion to adjourn. Are we going to executive session? Uh, um, we no. are not going. No. It, uh, is there a second? All those in favor? Thank you. Thanks, Mario.